Mr. President. The Senator from Kentucky. There comes a time, there comes a time in the history of nations when fear and complacency allow power to accumulate and liberty and privacy to suffer. That time is now, and I will not let the Patriot Act, the most unpatriotic of acts, go unchallenged. At the very least, we should debate. We should debate whether or not we are going to relinquish our rights or whether or not we are going to have a full and able debate over whether or not we can live within the Constitution or whether or not we have to go around the Constitution. The bulk collection of all Americans' phone records all of the time is a direct violation of the Fourth Amendment. The Second Appeals Court has ruled it illegal. The President began this program by executive order. He should immediately end it through executive order. For over a year now, he has said the program is illegal, and yet he does nothing. He says, well, Congress can get rid of the Patriot Act. Congress can get rid of the bulk collection, and yet he has the power to do it at his fingertips. He began this illegal program. The court has informed him that the program is illegal. He has every power to stop it, and yet the president does nothing. Justice Brandeis wrote that the right to be left alone is the most cherished of rights, most prized among civilized men. The Fourth Amendment incorporates this right to privacy. The Fourth Amendment incorporates this right to be left alone. When we think about the bulk collection of records, you might ask, well, Maybe I'm willing to give up my freedom for security. Maybe if I just give up a little freedom, I'll be more safe. Well, most of the information that comes on whether you're safe or not comes from people who have secret information that you're not allowed to look at. So you have to trust the people. You have to trust those in our intelligence community that they're being honest with you that when they tell you how important these programs are and that you must give up your freedoms, you must give up part of the Fourth Amendment, when they tell you this, you have to trust them. The problem is, is that we're having a great deal of difficulty trusting these people. When James Clapper, the head of the intelligence agency, the director of national intelligence, was asked point blank, are you collecting the phone records of Americans in bulk? He said no. It turns out that that was dishonest. And yet President Obama still has him in place. So when they say, oh, how important these, these programs are and how they're keeping us safe from terrorists, we're having to trust someone who lied to a congressional committee. It's a felony to lie to a congressional committee, and nothing has been done about this. So about a year ago, we began having this debate because a whistleblower came forward and said, here is a warrant for all of the phone records from Verizon. And you say, well, maybe they had evidence that people at Verizon were doing something wrong. There's no evidence. This is they want everyone's phone records. I don't have a problem with going after terrorists and getting their records, but you should call a judge. You should say the name of the terrorist and you get their records as much as you want. If I'm the judge and they ask me for the Sonarf boy's records, the Boston bomber, the Russians had investigated him. He'd gone back to Chetnia and yet nobody even asked for a warrant to look at his stuff. We didn't even know he went back to Chetnia and then we had the disaster of the Boston Marathon. I would make the argument that we spend so much time getting the haystack bigger and bigger and bigger that we can't find the needle because the haystack's too darn big. And we keep making it bigger and bigger, and we're taking resources away from the human analyst who should be looking and seeing when Sonarf travels outside of our country. We recently had another terrorist travel from Phoenix to Texas. We had arrested him previously. My guess is there was sufficient cause, probable cause, for a real warrant to look at his activities, and we should. 
But I don't think we're any safer looking at every American's records. In fact, when this came up, the government said, well, we've captured 52 terrorists because of this. But then when the president's own privacy commission looked at all 52 of them, there was a debate about maybe whether one had been aided, but not found by these records and would have been found by other records. We have to decide as a country whether we value our Bill of Rights, whether we value our privacy, or whether we're willing to give that up to feel safer. Because I'm not even sure you really can argue that we are safer, but people will argue that they feel safer. But think about it. Is the standard to be, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, but that everything should be exposed to the government, that all of your records can be collected. Now, some will say these are just boring old business records. Why would you care if they could find out who you called and how long you spoke on the phone? Well, two Stanford students did a study of this. They got an app, and they put the app on the phone voluntarily for 500 people. And these people then made phone calls, and all they looked at was how long they spoke, metadata, and who they spoke to, the, 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 the phone number they were connected to. And what they found was, is that without any other information, 85% of the time they could tell what their religion was. More than 70% of the time, they could tell who their doctor was. They could tell what medications they took. They could tell what diseases they had. The government shouldn't have the ability to get that information unless they have suspicion, unless they have probable cause that you've committed a crime. The appeals court, when they looked at this, was flabbergasted that the government would make the argument that this was somehow relevant to... Um, an investigation, because that's what the standard is. Under the Constitution, the standard is probable cause, which means there's some evidence or suspicion that you've done something illegal. But the standard now is relevance, which means, is it relevant to an investigation? But the court said, even that looser standard of relevance, they said it, it completely destroys any meaning of any words if we're going to say every American's phone record in the whole country is somehow relevant to an investigation. But it gets worse. They don't even have to prove it. The government says to the court that they think it's relevant. But there is no challenge. There is no debate. It's just taken at face value or at least it was until this court, this court ruling was appealed. So you now have the second appeals court that said this bulk collection of phone records is illegal. There are many different programs going on. This is the only one we know about that our government is collecting our records, and the only reason we know about it is not because the government was honest with you. The government was dishonest. The director of national intelligence tried to basically lie to the American people and say it didn't exist. So we know about this one, but what other programs are out there? There's something called Executive Order 12333. There are some who believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg, the bulk collection, that there's an enormous amount of data being collected on people through this other program. One question is, if there is no Fourth Amendment protection to your records, are they collecting your credit card bills? I don't know the truth of that. I would sure like to know. I don't know whether to trust their answer if I ask them, if they'll be honest with us, to say are they collecting our credit card records. And people might say, well, your credit card records are just boring old business records. Why would you care? But think about it. If the government has your visa bill, they can tell whether you drink, whether you smoke, what restaurants you go to? What is your reading material? What magazines or books do you read? What doctors do you see? What medicines do you buy? Do you buy medicine? Do you gamble? All of these things can be determined. Not only can they determine stuff directly from your phone bill and directly from your visa bill, they now have the ability to merge all of this information. Apparently, they have the ability to collect your contact list. And sometimes they're collecting this in a way that's somewhat nefarious. We're supposed to be spying on foreigners, foreigners that might attack us, and I'm all for that. 
But what happens is there's a lot of data that goes in and out of the country. In fact, sometimes an email from New Jersey to Colorado might go through a server in Brazil. Once it gets to a server in Brazil, they can not only look at your metadata, how long and who, who you talk to, the content is now available. It all gets scooped up. It's all being analyzed. They're doing the social network of who your friends are. Some have said that this could potentially have a chilling effect on the First Amendment. There was a time in our country, not too long ago, in the lifetime of most of us, when if you had called the NAACP, that you might not want your neighbors to know. If you were a member of the NAACP, you might not want your neighbors to know. If you were calling the ACLU or a member of the ACLU, you might not want your neighbors to know. It can have a chilling effect on your expression of your speech, who you associate with, and whether or not you are fearful to have association with people because you're fearful that that knowledge might be known by the government. People say, well, certainly that would never happen. During the civil rights era, many of the civil rights leaders were spied upon illegally by the government through illegal wiretaps. Many Vietnam War protesters were also spied upon illegally by the government. The reason we have the Fourth Amendment is to have checks and balances. Everything that's great about our country are checks and balances. So when you, let's say you have a rapist or a murder in Washington, D.C. today, and let's say it's three in the morning and the police come to the house and they think the rapist or murder is inside. They don't just break the door down. If there's no commotion or no noise or no imminent danger, they stand outside and they get on their cell phone and they call a judge. And almost always the judge grants a warrant and then the police go in. But why do you want that to happen? Sometimes people will come up to me and they say, I'm a policeman, or I work for the FBI. Many of my friends are policemen in the FBI, and they say, well, don't you trust us? It isn't about the individual. Laws aren't about whether we trust one person or your brother's a policeman and your brother would never do any wrong. It's not about your brother. It's not about your friend. It's about the potential for there being a rotten apple, someone who would take that power and abuse their power. We have laws, not for most of us, it's for the exception. It's for the something out of the ordinary, but it's also to prevent systemic bias from entering into the situation. So for example, there was a time in the South when it might have been that a white person from the government might have decided they were going into the home of a black person just because of racial bias. You get rid of bias by having checks and balances, by always saying you have to ask somebody else for permission. When we we're leading up to the war for our independence. In about 1761, I believe, James Otis was arguing before the courts, and he was arguing against something called the writs of assistance. Writs of assistance were a type of warrant, but they were a generalized warrant. No one's name was on there. They just said, you're welcome to search anybody's house to make sure they're paying for the stamp tax. You wonder why the colonists hated the stamp tax? It wasn't just the tax. It was the fact that the government could break the door down, come in, and rifle through their papers. Writs of assistance were something called a general warrant. This same battle had gone on in common law in England and developed as one of our precious rights that we actually kept from the English tradition. John Adams wrote about James Otis, fighting against these general warrants, and he said that it was the spark that led to the American Revolution. This is how important this is. The Fourth Amendment was a big, big deal to our founders. The right to privacy, as Justice Brandeis said, the most cherished of rights is a big, big deal. We shouldn't be so fearful that we're willing to relinquish our rights without a spirited debate. The debate over the Patriot Act, which enshrines all of this and got this started, goes on about every three years or so. It has a sunset provision. It is set to expire in the next few days. But we are mired in a debate over trade. 
There's another debate over the highway bill, and the word is we won't get any time to actually debate whether or not we're going to abridge the Fourth Amendment, whether or not we're going to accept something that one of the highest courts in our land has said is illegal. Are we going to accept that without any debate? I, for one, say that there needs to be a thorough debate, a thorough and complete debate about whether or not we should allow our government to collect all of our phone records all of the time. In England, about the time of James Otis, there was another man by the name of John Wilkes. And I learned about this story in reading my uh, colleague, uh, Senator Lee's book recently. John Wilkes was a, he was a rabble rouser. He was a dissenter. Some called him a libertine. I don't know about his morals, but I know he wasn't afraid of the king. And the king was becoming more and more powerful at that time. It was one of the complaints that we had as well. And so John Wilkes began his own newspaper, and it was called the North Britain, and he, lay, he labeled the numbers. And uh, the one at this time became the North Britain number 45. It became so famous throughout England that it was also part of our idiom, part of our language in the United States. Everybody knew what 45 was if you mentioned it. But he wrote something about the king. He basically wrote what would be an op-ed in our day, and he he, he made the mistake of sort of uh, saying that the king's behavior, the prime minister's behavior, was the equivalent to prostitution. This did not make the king very happy. And so the king wrote out a warrant for the arrest of anybody that had to do with the writing of this North Britain number 45. But the warrant didn't have anybody's name on it. It was a generalized warrant. He said, arrest anybody. So they broke down John Wilkes's door. They rifled through and ruined the contents of his house, arrested him, put him in irons, and took him to the Tower of London. They did the same to 49 other people. But John Wilkes wasn't about to take this lying down, so John Wilkes actually then decided that he would sue the king. I tried doing the same thing, but I tried suing the president, and it hasn't gone so well. But the thing is, is that Everybody ought to think that they have the ability and the equality to sue even our leaders. So he sued the king, but something remarkable happened. This is in the early 1760s. When he sued the king, he actually won. I think the award was like a thousand pounds, which would be a, a significant sum of money for us in, in today's terms. But it was a big victory. It was part of the discussion going on simultaneously over here with James Otis. It was a big, big deal. So often, my party, we do such a great job talking about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, and I'm all for that. But the thing is, is I don't think you can adequately protect the Second Amendment unless you protect the Fourth Amendment. The right to privacy, the right to, in your house, your house is your castle, the right to not have your castle invaded is, is, is so important. I'll give you a, an example. A few years ago, you know, a lot of people think we'll be safer if we collect gun records. So they collected all the gun records and they had them in Westchester County near New York City. But then a newspaper decided they would just publish them. They really didn't think this through, but you can see the danger of what happens when the government has records and then releases them to everybody. Imagine if you're a woman who's been abused or beaten by his hus her husband, has left him. She lives in fear of him finding her. And now the registration comes out and says where she lives and that she has a gun. Or worse yet, where she lives and that she doesn't have a gun. Think of our prosecutors and our judges. I know many of them who put bad people away, and many of them have concealed carry. Many of them travel to work. The security meets them in the parking lot and they go to work, but they worry. We've had sheriffs and we've had prosecutors killed in Kentucky because the criminals were angry they were locked up. We don't want all of our records by the government to be put out there in public for everybody to know where we live and whether we have a gun or not. So you can see why the issue of privacy is not a small issue. It is a big issue. It was incredibly important to our founding fathers. 
Some have said it's too late. It's too late to even get this back. There have been articles written in, in the last few weeks that say whether the Patriot Act expires or not, the government will just keep on doing what they're doing. In fact, there's a provision in the Patriot Act that says any investigation already begun before the deadline can go on in perpetuity. The other thing is, is that there are people now writing. It was a uh, John uh, Napier Tye, who was the internet uh, watchdog for this program, who wrote that he believes that the Executive Order 12333 is really allowing all this bulk collection under what the president says are Article II authorities. Now, Article II gives the president and the executive branch different powers. But these aren't unlimited powers. Some think they are. Some say the president has the absolute power when it comes to war. Well, actually, Article II is actually comes after Article I. And in Article I, Section 8, the president was told that he doesn't get to initiate war. The most basic of powers with regard to war were not actually given to the president. They were given to Congress. What is sad about this What's going on now is that Congress hasn't shown, I think, sufficient interest in what the executive branch does on a host of things, whether it be regulation, whether it be the enormous bureaucracy, but really so much power has shifted and gone from Congress and wound up in the executive. It's the same way with intelligence. We have intelligence committees, but the question is, are they asking sufficient questions? Now, there are some. Senator Wyden has been a leader in this, and he and I have worked together, but he's really been the leader because he's been on the Intelligence Committee, and he has more information, really, than the rest of us do. But he's at, at times been hamstrung because once you know information, if it's told to you in a classified setting, you're not allowed to talk about it. So sometimes it actually makes sense, if you want to speak out, not to actually learn through the official channels, but to read on the internet, because if you learn about it through official channels, you can't say anything about it, even if the government is lying about it. We're talking about an enormous amount of information. We're talking about all of your phone records all of the time. Now, recently, there was some complaint by people in the newspaper, and they said, well, the government's really only getting a third of your records. They're not getting enough of your records. Some want them to get more of your records. The objective evidence shows, though, that we really have never gotten anyone independently. We've not found any terrorist independently of this. But still, some people are so fearful, they're like, how could we get terrorists? We'll be overrun with terrorists, and ISIS will be in every drugstore and in every house in America if we don't get rid of the Constitution, if we don't let the Fourth Amendment lapse, if we don't just let everybody pass out warrants. That's what we do under the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act allows the police to write their own warrants. This was one of the fundamental separations that we did with the Fourth Amendment. This was the, probably the most important thing we did was to separate police power from the judiciary, to have a check and a balance so you would never get systemic bias, so you would never get political or religious or racial bias in your judicial system. We separated these powers. But we now let the police write their own warrants. It's a special form of police. It's the FBI, but they are domestic police. The FBI is allowed to write their own warrants. These are called national security letters, and they don't have to be signed by a judge. There is no probable cause. If they come into your house, there is no ability for you to complain. In fact, sometimes they are now coming into our houses without us knowing about it. This is called a sneak and peek warrant. And like everything else, the government says we'll be overrun with terrorists if we don't let the government quietly sneak into your house when you're not gone, when you are gone, and put listening devices, search through your papers, and read all of your stuff while you're gone. You don't have to have probable cause necessarily for these. It's a lower standard. But we're letting the FBI write this without a judge reviewing it. I have a good friend who's an FBI agent. I play golf with him. He's like, don't you trust me? And I do. I do trust him. But I don't trust everybody. 
Madison said that if government were comprised of angels, we wouldn't need restrictions, we wouldn't need laws. Patrick Henry said that the Constitution's about restraining the power of government. It isn't about the vast majority of good people who work in government. It's about preventing the bad apple. It's about preventing the one bad person that might get into government and decide to abuse the rights of individuals. Some say, well, the NSA has never abused anyone's rights. That may or may not be true. They're giving us the information. We don't get to independently look at the information. They're telling us. It's the same group that says they weren't doing any bulk collection of data at all. But even if we presume that they are telling us the truth, it isn't really the end of the story because the story should be that we don't want to allow the abuse of power to happen. As the debate unfolded the first time for the Patriot Act, something occurred that happens frequently around here. There's not enough time. Hurry up, hurry up, there's not enough time. It's kind of like the debate right now. The Patriot Act, I'm not sure, unless we insert ourselves at this moment, that we'll have any debate over it. It's been set to expire for three years. We've known it was coming. And the question is, do we not have enough time because we just don't care enough? We're going to relinquish our rights or constrict our rights to the Bill of Rights, even though we know it's coming up, that we have to do something else that occupies all of our time? Senator Wyden and I have a series of amendments. Our amendments would try to reform some of this. Our amendments would say that NSLs, national security letters, can't be just signed by the police, that they would have to go to a judge. And people argue, well, how would we catch terrorists? The same way we catch other people who are dangerous, murderers and rapists and anybody in our society. In fact, when you look at the warrant process for criminal warrants, warrants are almost never turned down. But just that simple check and balance of having the police call a judge is one of the fundamental aspects of our jurisprudence. And we gave it up so quickly. We gave it up so quickly on the heels of 9-11 uh, of in the fear. But the thing is, is when the, when the Patriot Act came forward, most people didn't even read it. There was a committee bill and this and that, and there was a last minute substitution. It was given hours and it was simply passed in a fear, in a spate of fear. As we look at what happened at that time, I think we now have the ability to look backwards and say, is there another way? When we start with the doctrine that a man's house or a woman's house is their castle, it was a very old notion, maybe even dating back to the times of Magna Carta. Our castle now and our papers are a little bit different now. And the Supreme Court hasn't quite caught up to where we are technologically. They're getting there. But this really needs to be debated and discussed at the Supreme Court level. Because the thing is, is we don't keep our papers in our house anymore. In fact, we've gone to such a paperless society that 90% of your paper, or if you're under 30 years old, 100% of your paper is held somewhere else. But the question we have to ask is, do you retain a privacy interest in your records? When the phone company holds your records, do they have an obligation to keep them private? Do you retain a privacy interest? If the government wants the records from the phone company, should they be allowed to write the name Verizon and get all of the records for Verizon? I frankly think that if John Smith has his phone service with Verizon and he's a terrorist, the warrant should say John Smith and go to Verizon but it's an individualized warrant. I don't think we should have generalized warrants. There are some who want to replace now the bulk collection of records with a different system, where the government doesn't hold the records, but the phone company holds the records. I'm also concerned about this. For one big reason, the, the, the recent court case has said now that the Patriot Act does not justify the collection of records, that it's actually illegal under that. I'm concerned that since the court is now saying that Section 215 doesn't allow bulk collection, that in trying to reform this, 
what's called the USA Freedom Act, but by trying to reform this, we actually will be granting new power to Section 215 that the court says is not there. The court is saying that it stands logic on its head to say that relevance means nothing, that everybody's record in the whole country could be relevant. We've even changed over time the investigations, whether or not there's a full-flown investigation, the beginning of an investigation, who gets to decide or define what an investigation is? The bottom line is, though, as we look at this and as we move forward, we have to decide whether our fear is going to get the better of us. Once upon a time, we had a standard in our country that was innocent until proven guilty. We've given up on so much. Now people are talking about a standard that is, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Think about it. Is that the standard we're willing to live under? Think about whether or not your records, as held by the credit card companies, your bank, or the phone company, whether you believe that you still have a privacy interest in these. In the Patriot Act, they did something to make it easier to collect records and to override your privacy agreement. If you read the nitty gritty of any of these agreements that you have when you use a search engine or when you're on the internet, you do voluntarily say that your information will be shared in an anonymous way, but they promise that they're not giving your name to somebody. Phone company has the same sort of privacy arrangements, privacy agreements. But what has happened is, through the Patriot Act, we've given them liability protection. And at first blush, you might say, well, we have too many damn lawsuits. I'm kind of that way. I'm a physician. We got way too many lawsuits. I'm for cutting back on lawsuits. But at the same time, if you give the phone company or the internet company or the credit card company immunity to ignore your privacy agreement, they will. So the new system is, instead of the government storing billions and billions of records in Utah, we're still going to store billions and billions of records in the phone company, but still the question is, will we access them in a general way? It says we're going to do a specific person, but if you look where a person is defined, a person could be a corporation. I don't think you should have a warrant that says Verizon and gets all the records for all of the customers. The other thing that's been going on that they haven't been completely honest with, and we may have some data on, is that the government is going inside of the software. They're asking people like Facebook or demanding people like Facebook that they give them access through their source codes so the government can get in. Now, to Facebook's credit, Facebook is fighting them, and I think more companies now are standing up and trying to fight against this. But the government is going in in a nefarious way into the code of Facebook and then inserting malware into other people's Facebook and spreading it throughout the Internet. The government also is looking at communication between two nodes. So let's say you communicate with Google and it's encrypted, but then when Google has a data center that talks to another data center, there's a place in which it's non-encrypted, non and the government's just simply hooking up to the cable and siphoning off records. There is a danger that you'll have no privacy left in the end of this. The Fourth Amendment's very specific. The Fourth Amendment says you have to individualize a warrant. You have to put a name on the warrant. You have to say specifically what records you want. You have to say where they're located, and then you have to ask a judge for permission. The sneak and peek warrants that I was talking about before is Section 213. It's now permanent law. We don't even get a chance to talk about it. We could repeal it, and I will have an amendment to repeal it. This is where the government goes in secretly. And they say, well, we need this lower standard because terrorists will get us if we don't. Well, we've now had it on the books for a decade, and you know who they're getting? Drug people. People are either buying, selling, or using drugs. That's a domestic crime. Which also leads me to something else about the Patriot Act that really bothers me, is that when we first started talking about um, the standards, going from probable cause, which is what the Constitution has, to uh, articulable suspicion down to relevance, we said, well, 
we're going to lower standards because we're going after foreigners. They're not Americans and they're not here. We're going to lower the standard. And, and really, there can be some debate in favor of that. When we first did it, though, we said that you couldn't use that information for a domestic crime. And I'll give you sort of the example. And I asked one of the uh, intelligence uh, folks at one time to answer this and was dissatisfied with the response. Let's say the government comes in through a sneak and peek uh, warrant. They don't tell you they're in your house. They find out, guess what, you're not a terrorist, but you have uh, paint in your house that you bought through your office business expense and you're painting your house at home, which is a, is a tax violation. It's a domestic crime. But they got into your house through false pretenses. They said you were a terrorist. They just were wrong. But they found out that you're uh, not being perfectly honest with your taxes. But they've gotten into a lower standard. And so ultimately, if we let them collect all of your records and we let domestic crime be prosecuted by this, we could have the government sifting through your credit card records because they say the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect records or your phone records not the content, just all of this data, putting it together and meshing it and deciding that maybe you're somebody who run traffic lights by, the, by the, your footprint, your digital footprint. The thing is, is now we're then taking something that was intended to capture foreigners and we're gonna capture people domestically and prosecute them for domestic crime. The specific thing they promised us never to do. So things morph and they get bigger and bigger. We can have a valid debate about whether we've gone too far, but we ought to at least have a debate. Shouldn't we get together and say, let's have a debate. Let's devote a week to this. I've been asking for a while to have a full day and have five or six amendments that Senator Wyden and I could put forward and have a full-fledged debate over whether or not the bulk collection of our records is something we should continue to do. Now, I think if you look at this and you say, where are the American people on this? Well, there's been poll after poll. Well over half of the people, maybe well over 60% of the people, think the government's gone too far. But if you want an example of why the Senate or Congress doesn't represent the people very well, or why we're maybe a decade behind, I'll bet you it's 20% of the people here would vote to stop this, to truly just stop it, at the most. Whereas it's 60, 70% of the public would stop these things. You're not well represented. What's happened is that I think the Congress is maybe a decade behind the people. I think this is an argument for why we should limit terms. I think it's an argument for why we should have more turnover in office because we get up here and we stay too long and we get separated from the people. The people don't want the bulk collection of their records. And if we were listening, we'd hear that. The vote in the House, while I don't think the bill is perfect, and I think it may well continue bulk collection, was over 300 votes to end this program, to say we're no longer going to have bulk collection. And yet it looks like the majority in this body still says we need bulk collection. In fact, the biggest complaint from the majority in this party, the majority in this body, is we're not collecting enough records, that we need to collect more records. Can you have security and liberty at the same time? I had breakfast with a high-ranking uh, official from our intelligence community, oh, maybe six months ago, and I asked him, how much information do you get from metadata and how much do you end up getting from uh, a warrant? And he says, without question, you get more from a warrant. People talk about whether we can go one hop or two hop. That means if someone's, if you're, if you're suspected of terrorism and you called 100 people, if we look at your records, that's one hop. If we look at the records of the next 100, that's a second hop. So as you go in, this pyramid gets bigger and bigger until you're talking about tens of thousands of people. But as you're getting farther and farther away from the suspect, I see no reason why you couldn't keep getting warrants. If they say the warrants are slow and laborious and there's not a judge, put more judges on the court. If they say they need them at 3 in the morning, put the judges on 24-hour alert and you can call them at 3 in the morning. We do it every night all across America. We call judges for a warrant in the middle of the night. I see no reason why you can't have security and the Constitution at the same time. 
The president instituted a, um, it's called the Privacy and Civil Rights Board, and they went through a lot of this, and some of the things that they came up with, I think, were, were truly astounding. The amount of information, I think, is, is mind-boggling of what's being sucked up in this. There's something called Section 702 of FISA, and this has allowed them to collect information on Americans who might have been communicating with a foreigner. You say, well, that American's probably suspicious. Well, it goes out in ripples, and it just becomes this enormous amount, this enormous cache of information. When they looked at some of this recently, the Washington Post looked at this, they found that nine of 10 intercepted conversations were not the intended target. So I think there was one estimate that in the last year we had 89,000 targets. But if you multiply that and say that's only one-tenth of what we actually take, you're now looking at 900,000 records of people who had nothing to do with terrorism, didn't even really talk to the person. They incidentally talked to a person who talked to the person. It could be the terrorist called Papa John's, and you've called Papa John's. You're now on the same phone tree network. So it can ripple out in ways. That information shouldn't be collected. It shouldn't be put in a database, and it shouldn't be stored. Because ultimately, we're collecting so much information that it's all of your information. One thing that should concern us about simply going from a system where the government collects all these records and stores them in Utah to one where the phone companies are going to do it is actually some people in the NSA are acquiescing in this and saying, not so bad. That concerns me if the NSA is saying, not so bad. It concerns me that we're still going to have bulk collection. The debate we really need to have is whether or not your records, if someone else is holding them, if you still have any privacy, any kind of privacy interest in your records. I personally think that your phone records are still partially yours in a way, or that you have a privacy interest in them. This is going to become very important because your records, ultimately, there probably won't even be any records in your house. They're gonna be on your phone. And then your phone records are connected to the company. Who owns them? Do you have a right to privacy in those records? I think you can have security and freedom at the same time. But I think if we're not careful, this is gonna get away from us. When they found out that nine out of 10 intercepts were actually not the intended target, just ancillary information that they'd picked up, they also found that 50% contained email addresses that were US citizens. So let's say you collect a million pieces of information and you're just gathering this up and you're intended to go after foreign targets, it might be terrorists, but over half of this information, much of it incidentally gained, are actually US citizens. So what this is, is it's sort of an end run, they call it backdoor searches, but it's sort of an end run that has gone around the Constitution, gone around the Fourth Amendment to collect information that we've actually said should be illegal to be collected that way, but we're doing it because we've done an end run around. Also realize that you can send an email from Virginia to South Carolina, and it might go over a server in Brazil. If your email goes over a foreign server, all of a sudden, boom, all, everything's done. The Constitution's out the door. They can collect that, even the content. It's never revealed to you. Nothing's ever presented to you. It's all done within the executive branch with no advocate on your side. There are several programs that came out through this that are being collected. It's not just the bulk collection. There's a program called PRISM that's been out there for a while, and there's another one called Upstream. In PRISM, it's a surveillance program that collects internet communications of foreign nationals from at least nine major internet companies. Now, I think this wouldn't have happened if the internet companies were not given liability protection. I think what would have happened is they would have said, we're violating our obligation to our uh, customer and we're going to fight against this. 
But the Patriot Act even made it worse. The Patriot Act made it a crime to reveal that you'd been served with a warrant. So we've gone way beyond any typical constitutional mechanisms. In the upstream program, a similar thing happens, but this is when it, uh, the data is collected as it moves across U.S. junctions. The problem is not so much going after foreign communications, but going after incidental and collecting incidental communications that involve American citizens. John Napier Time was the section chief for the Internet Freedom in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy. He was going to give a speech, and I think this is very telling. This is uh, reported in the Washington Post. And so he had written his speech out, and he sent it for review. In his speech, he said, if U.S. citizens disagree with congressional and executive determinations about the proper scope of intelligence activities, they have the opportunity to change policy through democratic process. And you'd think, who could object to that? What would his censors say? How could they possibly say that we don't have the right through democratic process to change policies? They had him strike through intelligence processes because I guess they apparently think that we don't have the democratic ability to change these things. And the sad truth is it may be true because a lot of this is being done by executive order. Executive order... 12333 has no congressional oversight. In fact, the question was asked recently of one of the Senate leaders, will you investigate this? Now, there may well be a secret investigation going on, but there was some indication that it was really outside of our purview. I don't think anything the executive branch does should be outside our purview. The whole idea of having co-equal branches was to have checks and balances. One of the biggest problems I find in Washington is that sometimes the opposition party, so if you have a Democrat president and a Republican Congress, you'll get a little bit of adversity and a little bit of pitting ambition against ambition and check and balance. But the party that is the same party as the president just doesn't send, tend to push back, probably for partisan reasons. Now, it's not just the other party. It happens when Republicans are in power also. What happens is the political party that's the same power as the president tends to sort of be open to letting uh, things move on, just letting the president accumulate more power. But I think this should be telling that when he said we could change things through democratic action, President Obama's White House counsel told him that no, that wasn't true. He was instructed to amend the line and make a general reference to our laws and policies but to leave out intelligence policies as if we don't really get a say in what they do as far as what information they collect from us. John Napier Tai goes on to warn us. He says that unlike Section 215, Executive Order 12333, authorizes collection of the content of communications, not just metadata, even for U.S. citizens. So quite often we're told, well, we were told for years, don't worry, they're not collecting your data, they're just collecting the data of foreigners. Turns out that wasn't true. Now the big thing that they tell us is, well, we're, we're not collecting the content, we're just collecting the numbers. But when you read John Napier Tai, he says that the executive order authorizes collection of the content of the communications also, not just metadata, and also for U.S. persons. So the, the question is, if we get rid of bulk collection, will the executive continue to do it anyway? The other question is, why doesn't the executive stop this? It was started by executive action. It could be ended by executive action at any time. Where is the executive? How, how come the, the press give him a free pass just to say Congress needs to fix this? Sure, I messed it up. I broke it. I'm doing something that the second appeals court said is illegal, and I'm going to keep on doing it until Congress does something. Why don't we see any questions from the press? 
Why don't we see anybody from the media saying, Mr. President, it's illegal. You started it. You are performing a program that is collecting all of the phone records from all Americans. It's been declared illegal from the second highest court in the land. Why don't you stop? I've not ever heard him ask the question. With the executive order, apparently, because this, they say, is Article 2, and that Article 2 to them means they can do whatever they want without any oversight by Congress, the conclusion by John, John Napier Ty is that there is nothing to prevent the NSA from collecting and storing all communications. This concerns me. The President instituted or brought together a group called the Review Group on Intelligence and Communication Technologies. And in it, they came forward with some recommendation. Recommendation number 12 was that all of this data, that's all this incidental data that's becoming part of these databases that is collected under these authorities, the executive order, should be immediately purged unless there is a foreign intelligence component to it. The review group further recommended that a U.S. person's in a incidentally collected data should never be used in a criminal proceeding against that person. So now we're back to what I was talking about earlier. If you're going to go away from the Constitution, if you're going to say to catch bad guys, we can't really have the Constitution, we're going to have to have a bar that's a lot easier to cross that allows us to do kind of what we want, wouldn't you want to exclude American citizens from being convicted or put in jail for a crime under a lower standard. It's kind of like this. The question is, if the government can come in without a valid search warrant, without announcing that they're in your house, collect all of your data, would you want them to have hours and hours in your house without any probable cause and then start arresting you for this? There are rumors that we are doing this. There are rumors that intelligence warrants, which are non-constitutional, which are at a lower standard, are being used to get regular criminals. What they do is collect information through data, metadata analysis, all of this. They get enough to be convinced that you're a drug dealer, then they arrest you by getting a traditional warrant, but they're using information that they got illegally to get to you. Section 213, this whole sneak and peek, where they go in without announcing that they've been in your house, 99.5% of the people arrested are actually people who've committed a domestic crime. They're not terrorists. So we're told you have to have the Patriot Act to get terrorists, and yet what we really find is that they're using it in a way that was not honest. They're using a lower standard a standard less than the Constitution, and they're using that standard then to arrest people for basic domestic crime. The President's Review Commission, that in review num and recommendation number 12, recommended that this incidentally collected data not be used criminally against anybody. They gave their recommendations to the White House. The White House stated that the adoption of these recommendations that they had requested would require significant changes and indicated that it had no plans to make any changes. So the President's own review commission says there's great danger in using a lower, less than constitutional standard to collect great amounts of information that can be searched. There's great danger to privacy. There's also great danger to using information collected outside of the Constitution. There's great danger in then using that for domestic prosecution. And the president said he has no intention of any changes. When I think of this president, it's probably what disappoints me most. There were times there were fleeting times when this president was in the U.S. Senate that he stood up for the Constitution. In fact, there's a quote from the president when he was running for office. There are many quotes, 
But there was one quote saying that the warrants that are issued by police, national security letters, should be signed by a judge. The very amendment that I will try to get a vote on, he seemed to have supported. But now his administration is issuing hundreds of thousands. Starts out with a few, 47, couple hundred. Now it's in the thousands. Anytime you give power to government, they love it and they will accumulate more. Anytime you give power to government and expect them to live within the confines of the, gov of the power, they will not live within the confines of power unless you watch them. Like a hawk, you've got to watch them. You have to have oversight. We're at a point now where we have enormous bulk collection, enormous collection of American citizens' data, one program we know almost nothing about, and yet it goes on with no debate. The executive order from 1981 has been transformed into a monster with tentacles that reaches into every home in our country. The collection of records that is going on is beyond your imagination, and we need to know about it. There needs to be a public debate. It's become even more pressing that we have this public debate because the problem is, is that you have the president and you have the Congress, and you have the intelligence community not being honest with us. So the fact that the director of national intelligence would come to Congress and lie and say they're not collecting this information, and then when they do admit to it, say, oh, but by the way, it's working really well, and we're capturing all kind of terrorists. But they hold all of the information, and we rely on them to be honest, to present truthful information to us. This is a big problem. Currently, the courts haven't, I think, brought their rulings up to date. The debate, though, has been going on for a long time. In 1928, there was the Olmstead case. The Olmstead case went against those of us who believe in privacy. And I believe that that case still lingers on even though it's been reversed. In the Olmstead case, uh, Ray Olmstead was a bootlegger. And uh, the government decided to eavesdrop on his conversations, but they did it without a warrant. They could have gotten a warrant. Who knows why they didn't get the warrant, but they didn't get a warrant. But the court ended up ruling that phone conversations were not protected by the Fourth Amendment. This was a sad day in our history when this happened in 1928. The dissent in that case was Justice Brandeis. And as so often occurs in our history, sometimes the dissent becomes the majority opinion and becomes profound because it was there at the time. Harlan's opinion, dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson's the same way. It becomes what everybody refers to. Nobody refers to the majority in saying that separate is equal. They were wrong. Same way with the Olmstead case. People now remember Justice Brandeis, and it's probably one of the most famous quotes in jurisprudence, that the right to be left alone is the most cherished of rights that it's the most valued among civilized men. We have this debate still sometimes, though, because some conservatives say, well, there is no right to privacy. I don't see it in the Constitution. Conservatives who argue there is no right to privacy aren't remembering the Ninth and Tenth Amendment very well, particularly the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment says that all the rights aren't listed but those that aren't listed are not to be disparaged. Even our founding fathers worried about this. Our founding fathers came forward and they at first thought we'd do just the Constitution without the Bill of Rights. And some of them worried, they said, if we do the Bill of Rights, people will think that's all we have. That if we list 10 different amendments, they'll think that's all of our rights. And so they finally convinced everybody to go along with it by saying, we'll put in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. The Tenth Amendment limiting the powers and saying only the powers enumerated are given to the federal government. Everything else is left to the states and the people, respectively. But the Ninth Amendment 
which is in many ways sort of the stepchild of our amendments, hasn't been adequately, I think, adhered to or recognized. It says those rights not listed are not to be disparaged. Sometimes we have this discussion because some people say what well, has to be enumerated. Now, I agree completely if we're talking about the powers given to government should be enumerated. They're few, few and limited, the powers given to the government. But it's the opposite with your rights. Your rights are many and infinite. Your rights are unenumerated, and you do have a right to privacy. So while the word, word privacy is not in the Constitution, in the Fourth Amendment, though, they do talk a lot about your privacy. It's about your home. It's about your home as your castle. The exact words of the Fourth Amendment are, the right of the people to be secure in, in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person and things to be seized. The reason why we should worry about whether or not a warrant is individualized is we've had some tragic times in our history. During World War II, we didn't individualize the arrest of Japanese Americans. We didn't say, that is so-and-so who lives in California, and we think they are communicating with Japan and telling our secrets. We indiscriminately rounded up all of the Japanese and incarcerated them. There have been times in our history when we haven't acted in an individualized manner. It happened throughout the South, in the old Jim Crow South. We, we told people that we were going to relegate them to a certain status based on a general category. So when we talk about individualizing warrants, we're talking about trying to prevent bias from occurring. Now, bias can occur for a lot of different reasons. I tell people, you can be a minority because of the color of your skin or the shade of your ideology. You can be a minority because of your religion. You can be a minority because you homeschool. But the thing is, is that if you are a minority, if you are a dissenter, if you dissent from the majority, you need to be very, very aware of your constitutional rights, very, very aware of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights isn't so much for the prom queen. The Bill of Rights isn't so much for the high school quarterback. Many people in life always seem to be treated fairly. The Bill of Rights is for those who are less fortunate, for those who might be a minority of thought, deed, or race. We have to be concerned about the individualization of our policies, or we, sh we, we run the risk, we run the risk and the danger of people being treated in categories. Right now we're treating every American in one category. There is a general veil of suspicion that is placed on every American now. Every American is somehow said to be under suspicion because we're collecting the records of every American. When we talk about metadata and whether or not or how much it means and what the government thinks they can determine from metadata, the people who say, don't worry, it's just your phone logs, it's no big deal, it's just boring old business records, should be a little bit concerned by the words of one uh, former uh, intelligence officer who said that we kill people based on metadata. Now, he wasn't referring to Americans. He's talking about terrorists. But we should be concerned that they are so confident of metadata that they would kill someone. So instead of us believing that metadata is no big deal and it just should be public information and anybody can have it, realize that your government is so certain of metadata that they would kill an individual over it. That seems to me to make the point that metadata is incredibly important if we would make a decision to kill someone based on their metadata.
The Electronic Frontier Foundation has done a lot of work for privacy and deserves a lot of credit. Mark Jaycox writes in an issue from last year that it is likely that the NSA conducts much more of its spying power under the president's claimed inherent powers and only governed by a document originally approved by an executive order. So while we're superficially having a debate over the bulk collection of records that some claim were authorized under the Patriot Act, Section 215, there's a whole other section that some privacy advocates are worried about that's even bigger. I had a meeting recently with one of the founders of one of the, the huge social communication companies. And he told me that he thinks that we're missing some of the debate here because he says everybody's talking about bulk collection of your phone records. He's convinced that there's ever so much more being collected through backdoor channels. These backdoor channels can occur in two ways. They can occur one way by going and looking at foreigners' information and then coming through the back door back into our country and looking at Americans' information, but then that American information has tentacles and spreads and it becomes this enormous uh, grouping of incidental information. In fact, some have said that it's uh, nine out of ten pieces of data pulled in aren't about a terrorist, they're just incidental stuff. What the President's Review Commission said is we should delete that once we find it's not relevant to an investigation. The amazing thing to me is, is that even people who support the Patriot Act, and I don't, I think the Patriot Act lowers the constitutional standards and risks our freedom and our liberty. But even for those who think the Patriot Act is fine, they say that the Patriot Act never was intended to do this. So if you want to ask yourself, is the government overstepping? Even the authors of the Patriot Act are now telling us that the overstepping is to such a degree that they think the Patriot Act doesn't justify it. In fact, that's really what the uh, court ruled recently. I had hoped the court would rule that the bulk collection, the grabbing up of all your records, that it was unconstitutional, but they actually simply ruled that the Patriot Act does not sanction it. The Patriot Act does not give the authority to the government to do this. And so it's a pretty amazing sort of set of circumstances is that the government has taken something that was intended in one way, completely transformed it, and then when they're rebuked by the, by the court, they're not chastened at all. So I still wonder why no one has had the guts or the wherewithal to ask the president. Why doesn't he stop this now? The president could today listen to this speech on the floor of the Senate and he could change his mind. He could this afternoon with his pen, he says he's got his pen and his cell phone, he could immediately stop the bulk collection of data. In fact, all of the alternatives he could, continue, he could probably do now. He could also say that he's going to collect the data with a warrant. He has all of that power. Someone should ask the president, Mr. President, why do you keep doing something the court has said is illegal? Why do you continue doing this and why won't you stop? And how could we possibly think that it is a responsible answer to say, oh, I'll stop when they make me? His own privacy commission says that what he's doing is illegal and should stop. One of the things that people are worried about is that the government is forcing their way into the code source of different uh, Facebook, Google, different internet companies. There's a couple of things that are occurring because of this. If you live in Europe, if you're Angela Merkel, or if you're anybody in Europe, you might not want American stuff anymore. So there are already rumors and discussion that billions of dollars, there's been some estimating over a hundred billion dollars has been lost to where we have been a dynamic leader in software and hardware in the internet. People don't want our stuff because they don't trust us anymore. One of the reasons they don't trust us is this. We have a group called the Tailored Access, Tailored Access Operation, 
targets system administrators and installs malware while masquerading as Facebook servers. That's a little scary that you go on Facebook and somehow malware is getting into your computer and then searching and, and allowing them to know what everything that you're doing on your computer. If you have a warrant, you can, to my mind, you can do a host of these things, but do it to someone you have suspicion of. I think we've made the haystack so big, no one's ever getting through the haystack to find the needle. What we really need to do is isolate the haystack into a group of suspicious people and spend enormous resources looking at suspicious people, people who we have probable cause. If you think of almost every instance, I mean, go back to 9-11. You'll have people come forward with the ridiculous assumption that if we had the Patriot Act, we wouldn't have 9-11. They say, oh, we would have caught those two terrorists in San Diego. And I'm like, you mean the two terrorists that were living with a confidential informant for a year? <laughs> we knew who these people were. They just weren't talking to each other. It wasn't a lack of gathering information. This, all this incidental and all this grabbing up of bulk records, that isn't what we needed. We needed the CIA to call the FBI. We needed further the FBI to call Washington and for somebody to listen to them. The 20th hijacker, a guy named Masawi, was captured a month in advance. We've got him in Minnesota. We've got his computer. He was captured because people said he was from a foreign country and he was attempting to learn to take off planes but not land them. The FBI agent there ought to be given a Medal of Honor. Instead of giving the Medal of Honor to the head of the FBI, we should have fired the head of the FBI and this FBI agent should have been made the head of the FBI. He wrote 70 letters to his superiors. He caught the 20th hijacker. He should be a well-known name on every lip of every American and a hero. He caught the 20th hijacker. He saved lives, but his superior got 70 letters and did squat. I have no idea what happened to his superior, but nobody ever was fired for 9-11. Instead of firing the people who didn't do a good job, we gave them medals. The guy who did a good job, I don't know what happened to him, and what we did is we decided we'd just collect everybody's information, that we'd sort of scrap the Bill of Rights. I've met a lot of our wounded soldiers. I've met young men that have lost two, three arms, two, three limbs, four limbs sometimes. I've met people that are paralyzed. And to a person, when I ask them, what were you fighting for? They tell me the Constitution. They tell me our way of life for our Bill of Rights. Don't you think they'd be disappointed to find out that they went over and they risked life and limb and gave up part of their bodies and they came home and while they were gone, we gutted the Bill of Rights? And not only did we gut it, and you can have a difference of opinion on this, but not only did we gut it, we don't have time to debate it. We, we just willy-nilly say, that's fine. Well, we're not even going to have time to debate it. We've known for three years this debate was coming up, and yet we squash a bunch of bills in the last week and we've got no time for the debate, no time for amendments, no time to discuss whether or not we're willing to trade our liberty for security. Franklin said, those who trade their liberty for security may wind up with neither. This is a very important debate that we need to have in the public, in the open. We worry about, or some of us worry, that just in discussion of bulk records, we may not get to other programs the, go the government just simply won't tell us about. A lot of them are written about, though. In another uh, episode of the Electronic Frontier Foundation's newsletter, they talk about a program called Muscular. Muscular is a program that is siphoning off data between different data centers, like Yahoo and Google sometimes have at least did have communication between them that wasn't encrypted. Your information was encrypted going to the data center, but then between data centers they weren't encrypted and the government's simply siphoning all this off through executive order. I don't know whether it's foreign, I don't know whether there's incidental American, I don't know what's being collected, and we have no oversight, no ability to vote on whether or not we continue this program or discontinue this program. The companies are sometimes not notified of the warrants, or if they are notified of the warrants, are told that they can't talk about them. They're gagged. 
This is the kind of stuff that we need to have in the open. Some of the information that people are talking about that the NSA collects on Americans are contacts from your address book, buddy lists, calling records, phone records, emails, and then they put it all into a data, and I think the program's called Snacks. They put it all into this data program and they develop a network of who you are and who your friends are through all the interconnection of all your contacts and friends. And if you ask them, is any of this protected by the Fourth Amendment, the answer you'll get is the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect third party records. So really, we're going to have to have this go to the Supreme Court. I said earlier that in the Olmstead case in 1928, Justice Brandeis is in the dissent. The vote is six to three, I believe. And the court rules that phone conversations have no protection. So we started out with a bad history. Phone was just coming around and becoming commonplace. And the Supreme Court said, your conversations don't have any protection. This went on for 40 some odd years until we get to the late 1960s, I think 1968, in the Katz case. And then they say, there is an expectation of privacy. So that was a big blow for those of us who believe in privacy that we finally decided your phone conversations are private and that you have an expectation of privacy and that it should take a warrant with your name on it, individualized with probable cause. But we go another dozen years, 10, 10 to 12 years, and we get another court case called Maryland versus Smith. And in it here though, the court rules that your conversations are protected from the government, that the government has to have a valid warrant to look at your conversations, but they end up saying that your records don't, and that the government is allowed to eavesdrop and pick up and accumulate records about your phone calls without a warrant. I think this was a big mistake. Now, the case in Maryland versus Smith, though, is one sort of petty criminal and a few uh, records over a few day period. The question that I'd like to see before the Supreme Court would be, is that equivalent to all Americans, all Americans' phone records all of the time? There was at least some kind of investigation going on of this person. They didn't do it the right way. I think they should have gotten a warrant. But in this case, what the government is arguing is that every one of you are somehow relevant to an investigation for terrorism. That's absurd. And finally, we get to the appellate court last week, and the appellate court says that. They say, frankly, it is absurd to say that everybody in America is relevant to an investigation. Not only is it absurd, not only is it a trifling with your privacy and your right to be left alone, but it takes our eye off the prize. Why do you think it is that there's not enough human analyst to know that Sonarev, the Boston bomber, was plotting to bomb the Boston Marathon. Why did we not know he got on a plane to go to Chetnia? One of the things that we were told, at least in the newspaper, was that he had an alternate spelling of his name. So we've been 15 years and we can't figure out that sometimes these names are spelled a little different and we didn't know he flew back and was radicalized in another country. I'm for spending more money and more time on analysts to investigate and look at the data connected to people of suspicion. But I don't want to spend a penny on collecting all the information from all of innocent Americans and giving up who we are in the process. We have to fight against terrorism. We have to protect ourselves. But if we give up who we are in the process, has it been worth it? Are you really willing to give up your liberty for security? What if the security you're getting is not even real? They said the 52 people they caught through the bulk collection program, the president's privacy, his own privacy, uh, uh, privacy group investigated and said not one person was captured. One, a possibility of one, but they already had information on him from some, from some other source. Under the executive order, we're still not talking about the Patriot Act. We're talking about something that nobody knows much about at all. No common member has been, uh, to my knowledge, informed of, the, of what's going on under this program. 
no, none of those not on the Intelligence Committee. But they have something called, with this information, called the Special Procedures Governing Communications Metadata Analysis. This is allowing the NSA to use your metadata, phone records, et cetera, who you call, how long you speak, under the Patriot Act and Section 702 to create social networks of Americans. So not only are we collecting your data, because the government says, and realize this, many of your elected officials are saying this, that you have no right to privacy, and the Constitution doesn't protect your records. They're collecting all of your records, some of it incidental, but they're creating these enormous uh, data banks, but then they're connecting metadata to other metadata to create social networks of who you are. You should be alarmed. We should be in open rebellion saying, enough's enough, we're not going to take it anymore. We should be in rebellion saying to our government that the Constitution that protects our freedoms must be obeyed. Where's the outrage? I tend to think young people get it. Young people, you see them, their lives revolve around their cell phone. They realize that if I want to know about their life, if I collect the data from their phone, not, not the content of their phone calls, but I collect the data from their phones, that I can know virtually everything about them. Do we want to live in a world where the government knows everything about us? Do we want to live in a world where the government has us under constant surveillance? Now, they'll say we're not looking at it. We're just keeping it in case we want to look at it. The danger is too great to let government collect your information. And I think there is a valid question whether or not simply the collecting of your information is something that goes against the Constitution. <clears throat> One of the other areas where we're seeing collection of data. I mean, it, it, it just would boggle your mind. We're not talking about just one, one program. We're talking about dozens of programs the government has instituted to look at your stuff. There's another group called EPIC, Electronic Privacy Information Center, and they talk about suspicious activity reports. These are reports that your bank has to file whenever you deal in cash at the bank. There's certain dollar limits. And they think, well, gosh, someone is probably a bad person if they're putting $9,500 in cash in the bank. Well, it turns out a lot of honest, law-abiding people do that. Not too long ago, there was a Korean husband and wife. They owned a grocery store. They dealt in a lot of cash, and they were very successful. And they deposited three times a day over $9,000, eight to $10,000. They tried to stay under $10,000 because there was all kinds of extra paperwork of you're over $10,000. And so what the government said is, oh, you're structuring your deposits to evade the people. You must be guilty of something. The government then can accuse people of a crime and take their stuff. There's something called civil asset forfeiture. It doesn't require that you be convicted. It doesn't even require that you be accused of something. There was a story not too long ago in Philadelphia, Christos Suravelos. And the teenager was selling drugs out of the back of the parent's house. So they caught the kid, and they were punishing him. But they decided they'd punish the parents, too. So they confiscated the parent's house, evicted the family. So teenager makes a mistake selling drugs. What does the government do? They take the parent's house. You think that's going to help the kid or help anybody get better in this situation by taking the house? But here's the rub. Kid didn't even have to be convicted of anything. The kid didn't own the house. He was just their kid. If we allow all kinds of data to be out there to catch people, and then we're not even going to require that you're convicted of a crime before we take your stuff, you can see the danger of allowing so much data to be collected. But we are currently convicting and taking people's stuff or their money simply based on what they're using it for. The Washington Post did a series of articles on this. Turns out that most people having their stuff taken are poor, often African-American, often Hispanic, but for the most part, poor. 
One guy was here in uh, Washington, was, uh, had $10,000, and he was going to buy equipment, uh, like a refrigerator or a commercial oven or something, uh, for his restaurant. They just stopped him and took his money. It took him years to get it back, and he only got it back because the Institute for Justice defended him in getting it back. But it turns justice on its head because he was basically considered to be guilty until he could prove himself innocent. Realize then that people like this are sometimes being picked up because of something called suspicious activity reports. Suspicious activity reports make your bank into a policeman or a policewoman. When you deposit things, they are obligated to report you to the police, I mean to the government. Does it sound something like 1984? Does it sound like when you have informants out there everywhere, see something, say something? that your banker is going to call the government if you put cash into the bank? The burden should always be on the government to prove that you're guilty of something. You should never be convicted. You should never be punished without there first being a trial, without there first being evidence, without there first being a, a trial with a lawyer, with a verdict. Some of this has uh, gone into the war on drugs. And the war on drugs has a lot of problems, but part of it has been the abuse of our civil liberties. But also part of the war on drugs has been that there's been a, a disparate racial outcome. What do I mean by that? There have been instances where, and if you look at the statistics, three out of four people in prison are black or brown for nonviolent drug use. But if you look at the surveys and you ask yourself, are white kids using drugs the same as black kids? It's equal. And white kids are 80% of the public. How did we get the reverse where 80% of the population in jail are black and brown? It's a problem. And if we can't figure it out, you're going to have to continue to realize why people are unhappy. If you want to know why there's unhappiness in some of our cities, you should read The New Yorker. About three or four months ago, they did a story about Khalif Browder. Khalif Browder is a 16-year-old black kid from the Bronx. He lived in a poor situation. His family had no money. He'd been in trouble before. But he was arrested, and he was sent to Rikers Island. 16 years old, arrested, sent to Rikers Island. His bail was $3,000. His family couldn't come up with $3,000, and he was kept for three years without a trial. At least some of it was in solitary confinement. He tried to commit suicide. Can you imagine how he must feel? Can you imagine how his parents must feel? Can you imagine how his friends feel, the kids he went to high school with? Do you think they think justice is occurring in our country? We have to be careful. We don't let slip away who we are in the process of all of this fight against terrorism, all of this fight against drugs. Because what happens is people take things that are bad. Terrorism's bad. Drugs are bad. But we take this fight about something that's bad we forget about the process of law, we forget about the rule of law, and we forget who we are in the process. But if you want to know why people are unhappy in some of our big cities, you want to see that unhappiness in the street, it's because some people don't think they're getting justice. And I frankly agree with them. I think there isn't justice in our country when this occurs. Originally, we had the Constitution. Then after 9-11, we got the Patriot Act. The biggest change between the Constitution, which provided protection from us for, from people, bad people, was able to incarcerate people for 200 years or more. The biggest difference is we changed the standard on how we would arrest people or how we would give out warrants. And I remember having this debate about three years ago when we talked about the Patriot Act. I was walking along talking to another senator and he was alarmed that the Patriot Act would expire at midnight. What would we do? And I was like, well, couldn't we for just a couple hours, you know, live under the Constitution? I mean, we did for 200 years, for goodness sakes. We have all kinds of tools. There's almost no judge in the land that's going to turn down a warrant. The FISA warrants, the ones they give for security, it's 99.9% .9 of them are approved. Couldn't we give out warrants? They say, oh, it takes too long. 
computers work in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye, if John Smith is thought to be a terrorist and he called 100 people, in a blink of an eye, I can look at the 100 on the list and I can say, what is the evidence that some on the list look suspicious? You know, are any of them from a, a foreign country? Or any of them on another list from somebody calling from a foreign country? There are ways to look at this where we would simply then get a warrant for the next hop and the next hop and the next hop. There's no reason why we can't catch terrorists the same way we catch other bad people in our society by using the Constitution. Initially, the government had to show evidence that you were an agent of a foreign power, but this is no longer true. Now you all, all you have to do is make a broad assertion that the request is related to an ongoing terrorism investigation. The problem in the FISA court is that when they take you to this court, it's secret, you don't get your own lawyer, and basically the government says to the FISA court judge, the government says, well, yeah, it's related to an investigation, but I don't believe they're forced to give information showing that it's related to the investigation. And in some ways, I think we've gone too far because what you end up having is you have people who are saying it's related, but the question is, is there any evidence that there's a relation to it, and how could there be a relationship of everybody in America to an investigation? We also often have given gag orders, and this is one of the big complaints of the internet companies. They get order after order after order, national security letter, they get all of these uh, suspicionless warrants, and then they're told they can't talk about it or they would go to jail. There are some people who got gag warrants that were librarians who for a decade or more were not allowed to talk to anybody to say that they'd gotten this warrant. The American Civil Liberties Union has written that the Patriot Act violates the Fourth Amendment, which says the government cannot conduct a search without obtaining a warrant and showing probable cause to believe the person has committed or will commit a crime. The ACLU goes on, though, to say that it violates the First Amendment's guarantee of speech, of free speech, by prohibiting the recipients of search orders from telling others. These are the gag orders. They also say that it violates the First Amendment by effectively authorizing the FBI to launch investigations of American citizens in part for exercising their freedom of speech. Now, they went back in and they wrote the rules and said, oh, you're not supposed to do it if it violates someone's freedom of speech. But the bottom line is, is that the opening that we've given to the intelligence community is so wide that there are, for all practical purposes, no limitations on the gathering of your information. In the Maryland versus Smith case, we kind of get to the point where we've said that telephone conversations are protected, but we've said trace and trap and pen register where they collect your data about your phone calls is not. The problem is, and this is a problem that needs to be corrected by the courts, at this point they're essentially non-existent. There are no protections in the court for any kind of warrant that has to be gotten for any kind of metadata. The FBI need not show probable cause or even reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. It must only certify to a judge, without having to prove it, that such a warrant would be relevant to an ongoing investigation. Also, typically in the past, when we gave warrants for wiretaps, they were sort of to entities. You kind of had to name the entity. But now we're giving uh, the ability to collect data pen register, trace and trap, data on your phone calls nationwide. And this is a severe departure from what we had had in the past because typically warrants were given under a judge's jurisdiction, so within a region. But now we have a blanket order that says we can collect any of your phone records anywhere, any of the time, across the whole country. And this goes against the history of the way we've had jurisprudence. We talk a lot about phone data, but your emails are in there too. Interestingly, your emails, after six months, have no protection at all. So any email that you have on your computer, 
after six months has no protection at all. Up to six months, there's a little bit of protection, but the government is able to look at, without a, a probable cause warrant, is able to look at who you're communicating with and the header on the subject line. The government is also able to look at, through metadata, the websites that you visit. You can see how that various groups would say that that might be an infringement of their First Amendment because let's say the government now knows that I go to Electronic Frontier Foundation or I go to Epic or I go to ACLU, I'm concerned with civil liberties. Am I a potential problem to the government? I'm concerned and I'm a critic of the government. Is it a problem that the government now knows what websites I go to and that I'm concerned with this? Now, if the government would hear, they would say, no, that's not what we're doing. But here's the, the, the other part of that question is, maybe not yet, maybe not now, but you can also squelch and severely restrict First Amendment uh, practices if just simply the fear of the government looking at is changing my behavior. There's already evidence, and there have been surveys, saying that 20, 25% of people doing things online are changing their behavior because they're afraid of the government. The government argues that the list of websites and websites addresses are simply transactional data. But I think that there's much more that you can garner from this data. The Patriot Act that is due to expire is just three sections. Interestingly, the complaints that I have uh, are a lot over Section 215, which the government claims is their justification for collecting all of your phone records. Now, the courts have said otherwise. The appeal court last week said that the business records does not give them the authority to collect your records. In fact, the court has been very specific that it's illegal. The president is currently ignoring the court, and the president continues to collect your phone data, all of your phone data, all the time, as much as they can get. They've not changed any of their behavior that I know of since it was declared to be illegal. Some of the changes, I would repeal the whole thing. I would repeal the whole Patriot Act. But some of the changes that I would favor if we were allowed to change it, if we could get a consensus in this body that would mirror the consensus that I think is in America, once you get outside the beltway of Washington and you go back into America and you ask people, are they for this? The vast majority of people think the government shouldn't collect all of their phone records all of the time. But there are some changes we could make in this. I think the first thing we ought to do is not replace this system, but to basically say that we're not going to collect data in bulk, that we're not going to collect your phone records, your credit card information, your emails, where you go on the web. We're not going to collect that in bulk. I think we could change the Patriot Act to say we're only going to collect data that has to do with someone who's suspicious, that we have presented some suspicion to a judge and that the judge says this is probable cause. The standard's not that hard. It's hard for me to imagine, in fact, a judge saying no. Judges almost always say yes. If at 3 in the morning tonight there's a murderer inside a house in D.C., what do you think the odds are that when the police call for the warrant that the judge says no? Virtually non-existent. Most of us want the judge to give them permission. But it's the checks and balances that we want so we don't have police who operate on bias or bigotry or religious discrimination. We want people to be bound by the rule of law. And it's kind of interesting because you'll hear Republicans sometimes give lip service to the rule of law. But in giving lip service to the rule of law, what happens is they seem to forget the whole idea of privacy. They're for it in economic transactions, but not so much with regard to personal liberty. The New York Times has uh, written and talked about some of the economic effects of this. In an article by Scott Shane a couple of years ago, he talks about the idea 
that foreign citizens, many of whom rely on American companies for email and internet services, are concerned about their privacy. Now, you can say you don't care about foreigners, and, you know, they don't get the same standard as we get, and so you can understand maybe there's going to be a lower standard, but realize if we're going to say the standard is quite a bit different and that there are no protection for anybody's data on the internet, realize that that standard is going to scare people in other countries away from our stuff. It's going to scare people away from our email companies. It's going to scare people away from our search engines. And I think if you'll talk to any of these companies out there, and some of these companies are the greatest success stories in, in our country. You think of the internet revolution, and you think how America has really led this. America has been the leader in this. We've created you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars of profit, and in our zealousness to grab up every information, and in our zealousness to ignore basically the Constitution, we're grabbing up so much stuff, we're scaring people to death. There's already been billions of dollars lost to American companies because of this. Because Europeans, Asians, they don't want our stuff anymore. They don't want things with our hardware. They don't want to deal with our services because they're fearful that the U.S. government's looking at all their transactions. And the government's pretty clueless over this. Recently, one of the members of President Obama's administration came out, in fact, several members of them, and they're complaining about encryption. They're like, well, you know, we're just going to have to maybe have some laws to prevent these companies from encrypting things. And it's like, don't you get it? Don't you get why companies, the encryption is a response to government. The encryption is a response to a government that's gone and run amok, basically collecting our information, collecting all of our information. And so if you're an American internet company, if you're an American search engine, if you're an American email company, what do you think you're saying? You're saying, the only way I'm getting Europeans back, the only way I'm getting Asians back is to say that I'm going to protect them from my government. Isn't that a sad state of affairs? People say, well, how will you get terrorists if everything's encrypted? Edward Snowden was using an encrypted email server. And the, the company that uh, was housing him, that was specifically the, the genre of their business. They had a business that was encrypted because some people want to be private for a lot of different reasons. Many of them legitimate business, legal, personal reasons. But anyway, when they came to get Eric Snowden's email, they didn't ask just to get his email. They said they wanted the encryption keys for their entire business. See, this is the problem. You have to realize the zealots who don't seem too concerned with your privacy rights, imagine what they're going to do if they say to Apple, we don't want just the encryption or you to let us in one time to see John Smith, who we think is a terrorist, we want you to let you in all of our products. If they force a good company like Apple to do that, who in the world would want anything from Apple anywhere in the world? There is a danger that we will destroy great American companies by forcing this surveillance into their products. Senator Wyden has also made a good point. If the government is going to mandate backdoor access to the code source, and the government's going to say that Facebook or Google has to let them in a backdoor, that's a window. That's a, a breach of the wall. It's a breach of protection. And Senator Wyden and others have made a good point. He said, if you do that, you're actually weakening these companies to attacks of cybersecurity. Because if somebody can get in, somebody else who's smart can get in as well. So there is a danger to letting the government in. There are dozens and dozens of these programs. The NSA has something called the Dishfire database. Stores years and years of text messages from around the world, which might be fine, except for it ends up trapping people who are also American citizens as well. It ends up tracking and trapping to purely domestic uh, texts that are, that are retransmitted outside the country. They have a program called TrackFin that collects and accumulates gigabytes of credit card purchases. 
I don't know, for some reason, I, I'm, I'm more appalled by the credit card purchases than I am the phone. Because I think of all the stuff you can buy with your credit card and what it indicates about you. With phones, you can find out a lot with people's phone records. I mean, I think uh, when the Stanford students looked at phone records, they found 85% of the time they could tell your religion by looking at your phone records. The vast majority of the time they could tell your doctors. The vast majority of the time they could tell what disease you had. The vast majority of the time the government can then also connect you through social networking and tell an extraordinary amount about you. But with a credit card, it's even more explicit than that. They can tell, do you drink, do you smoke, how much? What magazines do you buy? What books do you read? What medicines do you take? All that's on your credit card. And we're more and more that society. We're less and less a society of cash and more and more the society where everything's on paper. That should worry us. It should worry us that the government has access to all of our records all of the time. It should concern us that the government also says, when you ask them, and this is an important point, that your records, when held by a third party, are not protected at all. Now, it's debatable whether that's true or not. I think it needs to be looked at again by the court, and I think there are those who will in the court say that your third party records are. The Maryland decision was six to three. Justice Marshall, felt that your uh, third party records should be protected. He specifically mentioned that there was a potential stifling effect for association. There was a potential stifling effect for speech. And he was quite concerned that the government really should have a warrant to look at your records. My hope is that someday the Maryland versus Smith case is relegated to the dustbin of history in the same dustbin that we put Olmstead in. In Olmstead, they said you couldn't have any protection for your phone records. It went on for 40 years. I think we still live with some of that because we've, we've trained and taught the phone companies not to be great advocates for your privacy. And uh, there doesn't appear to be, to, to be seen a great deal of fighting on the part of the phone companies in advocating for you. Some of the internet companies have begun to step up. But I'd like to see both phone companies and internet companies stand up and say, we're not going to do it. We're not going to give you access to us, and you're going to have to take us all the way to the Supreme Court. If we did, if there was unified resistance among the consumer and among the companies to say, we're not going to let you have our data without a fight, and that you're going to have to prove suspicion, and that you're going to have to get a, general, a, a specific warrant, I think then we might be able to get back to a more constitutional scenario. There have also been, within the NSA, evidence of installing filters in the facilities of internet and telecommunication companies serving them with court orders and building backdoors into their software and acquiring keys to break their encryption. If this becomes the norm, you can see how people will flee American products and people will say, I'm not going to use American things. There's an enormous, beyond imagination, economic punishment to our country that is occurring now and going to continue and worsen if we don't wise up and send a signal. So for those in this body who say, we need to collect more information, we're not getting enough information, warrants be damned, I don't care what they do, take all of my information, get as much as you want, those people will have to explain why they're destroying an American industry and why people around the world are going to say, we are alarmed at that and we want some protections. If we're going to use American products, if we're going to use American email, we want to know that there's not going to be indiscriminate collect collection of our information. Bill Binney was probably, or is probably one of the highest ranking whistleblowers from the NSA. 
And the things he has to say should disturb us because he probably knows more about this than any of us will ever know. Bill Benny said that without new leadership, this is in our intelligence agencies, new laws and top-to-bottom reform, the agency, the NSA, will represent a threat of turnkey totalitarianism. The capability to turn its awesome power, now directed mainly against other countries, will now be turned on the American public. Originally, all of these intelligence um, forays were to get foreigners. And we lowered the standard saying, well, they don't live here. These are potentially terrorists. So we're going to have a lower standard. And they started out as foreign searches. In fact, the NSA was originally intended to search for foreigners and to search the information of foreigners. And I'm not opposed to that. In fact, uh, I was on uh, one of the Sunday morning programs this week, and they said, well, are you for eliminating the NSA? And I said, of course not. I'm for the NSA. I want the NSA to do surveillance that will help to protect us from attack. Not only am I for surveillance, I am for looking as deep as it takes. But I want some suspicion. I want suspicion that this person, this John Doe, that there's some evidence. You don't have to prove that they're guilty. You just have something that points towards them being suspicious. You go to the judge, and the judge says, here's a warrant. And I, I don't, if there's evidence that the people he called are suspicious, go back to the judge, get another warrant, go deeper and deeper. There's no reason why this couldn't be done nearly instantaneously. There's no reason why it couldn't be done 24 hours a day. And there's no reason why we can't have security and the Constitution as well. This battle has not been just about records. It's also been about another key part of the Bill of Rights, which is the right to a trial by jury, the right to due process, the right of habeas corpus, the Fifth and Sixth Amendment I see together as sort of the amendments that are with regard to your person and with regard to whether or not you're treated justly by your government. As we became fearful of terrorists, we said, well, we're just going to capture people and we will just hold them indefinitely. Now, it's one thing to catch someone on a battlefield in a foreign land shooting at us. And I've said repeatedly, people in battle don't get due process. But people outside of battle, particularly American citizens, should. But in some of these cases, we're talking about American citizens accused of a crime, perhaps terrorism, caught in our country. And we're going to say, well, they don't really deserve trials. They don't deserve lawyers. In fact, one senator said recently, and I, I, I find this really hard to believe, he said, well, when they ask you for a judge, just drone them. Ha <laughs> ha. Same guy said, well, when they ask you for a lawyer, you just tell them to shut up. About 10 years ago, Richard Jewell was thought to be the Olympic bomber. Everybody said he did it. TV convicted him within minutes. Everybody said he was the Olympic bomber. He fit the profile. He wore glasses. He was an introvert. And he had a backpack, and he seemed real helpful. Somehow that was the profile. Everybody said he did it. The only problem was he didn't do it. So here he was, uh, uh, he was accused of being a terrorist, of exploding something, killing, doing something terrible, killing innocent people. And I think to myself, if he'd have been a black man in the South in 1920, what would have happened to him? Or if he'd have been any American in this century, if the people who believe in no jurisprudence were really in charge, we should be afraid of ever letting these people get in charge of our government. Because the thing is, is that Richard Jewell was innocent. People say, well, these aren't just American citizens. They're enemy combatants. And we don't give any kind of jurisprudence, no judges, no lawyers for these people. They're enemy combatants. Well, it kind of begs the question, doesn't it? 
Who gets to decide who's an enemy combatant and who's an American citizen? Are we really so frightened and so easily frightened that we would give up a thousand year history? Magna Carta, even before we had juries, even in the Greek and Roman times, we had juries. Are we really willing to give that up? Give people a classification that the government assesses them, cannot be challenged. People don't get a lawyer. They don't get presented to the judge and told why they're being held, and we would hold them forever? And the response I got during the debate over this, and this was the debate over indefinite detention, the response I got was, well, yeah, we would keep them. We'd send them to Guantanamo Bay. An American citizen, sure, if they're dangerous. Kind of begs a question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? When this finally made it to the Supreme Court, though, and whether or not you can hold an American citizen, the Supreme Court rejected the administration's claim that those labeled enemy combatants were not entitled to judicial review. It took years and years to finally have the Supreme Court tell people that the Bill of Rights was still in effect. That if you're an American citizen accused of a crime in our country, no matter how heinous, you do have a right to a trial by jury. You do have a right to a lawyer. You do have the right of habeas corpus. You do have all of the rights of an American citizen. And that no one can arbitrarily take those away from you. And if you don't think that that's potentially a problem, think of the South in the 1920s. Think of what would have happened if Richard Jewell were a black man in the 1920s. He might not have lived the day. Think if Richard Jewell had been a Japanese American during World War II, when we decided that the right of habeas corpus didn't apply to you if your parents were from Japan, or if your grandparents were from Japan. There was an experiment, I remember, in, I think in college, it's a psychology experiment, and they put a patient or a person in a room, and they said, this person has information, and we're going to shock them just a little bit, and here's the dial. You get to decide. And they wanted to ask, how high would people turn up the dial? And it was uh, pretty scary that a good amount of people that you would imagine are normal, respectable people, how high they would turn the dial to shock somebody or to torture somebody. See, we think that wouldn't happen, but it does. And anytime you make an analogy to horrific people in history, a Mussolini or a Hitler, people say, oh, you're exaggerating. You're talking about it's hyperbole. And maybe it is. And particularly to accuse anybody of that is, is a horrific analogy. And I'm not doing that. But what I would say is that if you uh, are not concerned that democracy could produce bad people, I don't think you're really thinking this through too much. And that if you're not concerned about procedural protections, procedural protections are how evidence is gathered, how evidence is taken from your house, what rules the police have to obey. And people don't quite get this. We don't have a mature discussion on this. Because anytime we, talk, we try to say, well, this is to stop someone who could be a bad policeman, the media dumb it down and say, you're saying policemen are bad. No, it's the opposite. 98, 99% of policemen are good. In fact, of the general public, it's, it's pretty, pretty close to that. But the thing is, you have the rules in place for the exception to the rule. And so you have these procedures in place because maybe it isn't tomorrow we decide that we're going to round up all the Japanese Americans again and put them in internment camps. But maybe next time it's Arab Americans. So the thing is, we have to be concerned with this because you don't know who the, who the next group is that's unpopular. The Bill of Rights isn't for the prom queen. The Bill of Rights isn't for the high school quarterback. The Bill of Rights is for the least among us. The Bill of Rights is for minorities. The Bill of Rights is for those who have minority opinions. The Bill of Rights is those who are odd those who are oddballs, those who aren't accepted, those who have unconventional thinking. But if we are so frightened that we're going to throw all the rules out and we're just going to say, 
Here's my liberty, take it. Here are my records. I didn't do anything wrong, so I don't mind if you look at all my records. If you say the standard will now be, if I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to fear, look at everything I do, there will be a time and there will be a danger that in giving up your freedom, giving up your privacy, that you'll find that the world you live in is not the world you're, you intended. There have been good folks within the National Security Agency who have uh, talked about and have pointed out that we've gone too far. Bill Binney was one of those. He was a high-ranking NSA official who decided that they had gone too far. There was an interview, um, uh, it's probably been a, a year or two, with Bill Binney that was in Frontline. And one of the first questions was, what a lot of people in government will say is that you don't understand, we're still at war. Remember we lost 3,000 people on 9-11. This is a very important program, talking about the, the warrantless collection of all our records. It has saved thousands of lives, as Cheney said at one point. There are multiple plots that have been stopped because of this program. You've got to be care very careful about what you wish for, because if you do, you might have another attack. You might have blood on your hands. Fear. What is your reaction to this question about the effectiveness of what has been done? Benny replied, first of all, they like to lump it in as one program and say you can't cancel the program. In fact, Benny was famous because he'd been working on a program that did investigate terrorists but protected American information and deleted American information uh, from incidental collection. So he said it's false to begin with. It's multiple programs. The one program that dealt with domestic spying was called Stellar Wind. Stellar Wind was one that was created also by executive order and was done without the permission of Congress before the Patriot Act. They had the other foreign ones. You mentioned the names. There were other names that were listed in the prison program that were dealing with foreign intelligence. There were a whole bunch of these programs, not just one. So the point is, is that you stop the intelligence, the domestic intelligence program, period. So Benny's opinion was, and this is a guy who wrote a lot of the original programs. Bill Benny said he would continue gathering the information on foreigners. This is a guy who worked for 30 years for the NSA. He's not some dove who doesn't want to do anything about terrorists. Bill Benny worked for 30 years to develop the programs that help us cast ter catch terrorists, but he felt like it wasn't proper or constitutional to collect Americans' records without a warrant. He said, if we get incidental records, destroy them. Don't collect them. He says, eliminate them. The records of Americans are irrelevant to anything that the incidental collection that is going on. All the, all the terrorists would have been caught by the process that we put in place for Thin Thread. Thin Thread was a program that they had before they went to the unconstitutional program. It was looking in and focusing in on the groups of individuals that we already had identified and anybody in close proximity to them in the social graph, plus anybody. The other simple rules, like anybody that was looking at jihadi websites, et cetera, that would get them all. And you didn't have to do the collection of all this other data that requires all that storage, transport of information to the storage, maintenance of it, interrogation programs, all of that added expense that they're incurring as part of it over the last 10 years. You wouldn't have had to have any of that. Frontline then asks, this problem of haystacks, how big a problem is it? Is that what we've done? Is we've created a situation where the haystacks are bigger and it's almost impossible to find? This is Frontline's question, and it's a question I've been asking also. If you collect all of Americans' records all the time, if we collect all of your phone records, 
Can we possibly look at them? Now, computers are getting better, but still there has to be a human involved. I think we're overwhelmed with the data. At one point in time, about a year ago, uh, I remember an article where I think they've collected millions and millions of audio hours. They've just been collecting. Every, every, they're siphoning, they're vacuuming up everything. And I think they'd only been able to listen to about 25% of it. So the thing is, is that there is some information that we need to get and we should get. When the Sonarif boy, the Boston bomber, goes to Chechnya, we, we needed to know that. We needed to continue to see if there was evidence that we could take to a judge to continue to investigate him. So we do need surveillance, but what we don't need is indiscriminate surveillance, and we don't need the haste act to get so big that we can never find the terrorist in the stack. Vinny responds, well, what it means simply is you use the traditional argument they say, we're trying to find a needle in the haystack. It doesn't help to make the haystack orders of magnitude larger because it makes orders of magnitude more difficult to find that needle in the haystack. Frontline. And is that what they've done? Have we made the haystack so large that we're actually having more trouble catching terrorists because we're scooping up and swooping up all of America's data? Benny. That's what they've done. And now they're looking at things like game playing and things like people doing that. I mean, this is ridiculous. How relevant is that to anything? Frontline, but they say they're computers. And in Utah, they're going to be able to take all this stored data and they're going to be able to go through all of it. And they're going to be able to connect the dots, connect the dots. That's what everybody wanted them to do after 9-11. Bill Benny, the former senior, NSA, see, that's always been possible. Before 9-11, we were doing that. That was already happening. We already had that program. That wasn't an issue at all. That's why we should have picked this out from the beginning. We should have implemented it, this thin thread program that he'd already been working on, connect the dots, everything in the world, but we didn't. That's why we failed. It wasn't a matter of not having the program. It was a, not, it was a matter of not implementing what we had. When 9-11 came, we gave medals to the heads of our intelligence agencies. No one was ever fired. And yet the 20th hijacker was caught a month in advance. Masawi's caught in Minnesota for trying to take off planes but not land them. The FBI agent there wrote 70 letters to his superior trying to get a warrant. It wasn't that we had to dumb down and take away the procedural protections of warrants. The warrant wasn't denied. They'd have a much stronger argument if they could say, well, we tried to catch the terrorists, but the judges kept saying no to warrants. It's absolutely not true. They didn't ask the judge for warrants. So the 70 requests in Washington sat at FBI headquarters and weren't requested. You also had another hijacker in Arizona training to take planes off. Once again, the FBI agent there doing a great job in sending the information to Washington and people not talking to each other. It had nothing to do with saying the Constitution is too strong. We have to weaken the Constitution or we'll never catch terrorists. It had nothing to do with that. But that's precisely the argument we had. In the aftermath of 9-11, the Patriot Act was rushed to the floor, several hundred pages. Nobody read it. Didn't come out of the, there was one out of the committee. They didn't use that. They rushed a substitute to the floor and no one had time to read it. But people voted because they were fearful and people said there could be another attack and Americans will blame me if I don't vote on this. But we're now at a stage where we should say, are we willing to give up our liberty for security? Can you not have both? Can you not have the Constitution and your security? I think you can. Several agents other than Bill Binney have also said, several national security officials, that the powers granted the NSA 
go far beyond the expanded counterterrorism powers granted by Congress under the Patriot Act. The court now agrees with that. And any time someone tries to tell you that metadata is meaningless, don't worry, it's just who you call, it's just your phone records, it's not a big deal, realize that we kill people based on metadata. So they must be pretty darn certain that they think they know something based on metadata. Now these are ostensibly or presumably terrorists that are being killed, but what I would say is that if they're killing people based on metadata, I would think you would want your own metadata pretty well protected. To give you an example of how representatives are sometimes getting it right, in the House of Representatives, they have seen and responded to the people. Thomas Massey and Representative Lofgren introduced an amendment to the Defense Appropriation Bill last year. This amendment would have defunded the warrantless backdoor searches, what they're doing through 702 which is an amendment to the uh, FISA Act. This is where we say we're investigating a foreigner, but the foreigner talks to an American who talks to other Americans, and it ripples out into enormous amounts of incidental information. The information from 702, when you analyze it, nine out of 10 bits of information that are collected are not about the person we've targeted. They're incidentally collected about other individuals. But when Representative Massey and Representative Lofgren introduced their amendment to defund the backdoor searches and to tell the CIA and NSA that they cannot mandate that companies give a backdoor entry into their product, the amendment passed 293 to 123. But just to show you that no good deed goes unpunished, and just to show you the arrogance of the body, the vast majority of people don't want their phone records collected without a warrant. But what did they do when this passed 293 to 123? They stripped it out in secret, in conference committee, and it was gone. And the reason it was gone is like everything else around here. You wonder why your government's completely broken? We lurch from deadline to deadline and it's on purpose, really. We, we do deadline to deadline because it's in, we gotta go, it's, it's, it's spring break, we're gonna be late for spring break, and we've gotta go, so we've gotta finish this up before we go. It's how the budget is done, so no one ever votes on whether we're gonna spend X or Y. They put the whole budget into 2,000 pages, nobody reads it, it's placed on our desk that day, nobody has any idea what's in it, None of your concerns about your government are ever addressed. We just pass, boom, the whole thing, and it's out the door. It's the same way with these kind of things. Because there's a deadline, and this amendment was passed, 293 to 123, saying that we shouldn't fund these illegal searches and that we should stop the bulk collection of records, it's passed overwhelmingly, and yet in secret, Somehow it's taken back out of the bill and never becomes law. Now, while I don't agree completely, or really at all, with the reform that's come forward out of the House, it's at least evidence that they're listening. They have a bill that would end the bulk collection of records, but replace it with, I think, maybe another form of bulk collection. But it's still, it passed overwhelmingly, 330 some odd votes. But you know what you hear when it gets over here? They say the Senate is distant more from the people and not as responsive. Absolutely true. And sometimes to the detriment of the public. Because the thing is, is that while it's overwhelmingly popular with the American people that we shouldn't be collecting your phone records without a warrant, without a warrant with your name on it, and the House has recognized this and passed something overwhelmingly to try to fix it, the first thing that I hear over here from people is, well, we're not collecting enough of your phone records. They're disappointed that the government isn't getting, they, they have access and they claim they can get, they ha gain access to everything, but the government's really not collecting all of it. So people over here are disappointed, they wanna collect more. 
So the American people say, enough's enough. We want our privacy protected. We want the government to take less of our records. Congress recognizes that, the House of Representatives. Then it comes over to the Senate, and the Senate says, oh, my goodness, we want to collect more of your records. We don't think we're getting enough into your privacy. We don't think we've completely trashed the Bill of Rights enough. Let's try to gain more of your records. One of the other things that the Massey Lofgren Amendment did, that did pass over there, was to get rid of and say that no funds would go to mandate or request that a person alter his product or service to permit electronic surveillance. Because, see, this is what's going on, and it is pretty nefarious and really, I think, antithetical to freedom, is that our government is telling companies like Facebook and Google and these other companies, they're forcing them to let the government have access into their product. Well, everybody knows this is going on. It's no secret. And it's killing these companies in their worldwide market because non-Americans don't want to use our email. They're afraid the government has forced their way into all their transmissions. There's currently another uh, bill in the House uh, put in by Representatives uh, Pocan, Massey, Grayson, and McGovern that would repeal the entire thing, repeals the Patriot Act and FISA amendments of 2008, permits the court to appoint experts, permits the courts to have appeal, basically tries to make our intelligence courts a little bit more like an American court or American jurisprudence. EPIC is the Electronic Privacy Information Center. And they talk some about these national security letters that I mentioned earlier. National security letters, there are now hundreds of thousands of these. And these are letters that are not, they're warrants. They're not signed by judges. They're actually signed by the police. And this goes against sort of the fundamental uh, precept of our jurisprudence, the fundamental um, aspect was that we divided police from the judiciary. And it's supposed to be a check and balance in case uh, the local policeman had some sort of bias. They always had to call somebody else. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than not having a check and balance. So when we got to NSLs, this comes out of the Patriot Act. They start out with a few thousand. They grow and grow and grow. Now there's hundreds of thousands of them. But realize that the national security letter is similar to what we fought the revolution over. We fought the revolution over writs of assistance, which are basically generalized warrants, but they were also written by British soldiers. And we were offended, you know, that a soldier would come into our house with a self-written permit. A lot of the reaction and the reason we wrote the Bill of Rights the way we did is that we were concerned with British abuses. We were concerned with the idea of general warrants. So when we wrote the Fourth Amendment, we said that it had to be specific to an individual. We said that you had to name the individual. And that's one of the real problems with the bulk collection of records, is that they're not really based on suspicion of an individual. Because basically, the government is collecting all of your records indiscriminately. The government's not even obeying the loose restrictions they put in place. So the Constitution says you have to have probable cause. You have to present some evidence to a judge. You don't have to prove that they're guilty, but you have to have enough evidence that the judge says, you know, it looks like that person could be guilty of a crime. So with the Patriot Act, we lowered that standard, and we then lowered it again. For collecting information under the Patriot Act, all you have to do is say that the information you want is relevant to an investigation. Well, when this gets to the court, the court basically says this is absurd. So two weeks ago, the court just below the Supreme Court says it is absurd to say that every American... Every American's phone record is somehow relevant 
to a terrorist investigation. They said that it, it, it takes the meaning of the word relevant and basically destroys any concept that the word has meaning at all. So the Patriot Act went to a much lower standard, not probable cause, but just that it might be relevant to an investigation. And even with that lower standard, the court said, that's absurd. So the president, how does the president respond? The president responds by doing nothing. The president could end this program tomorrow. So every one of your phone records are being collected without suspicion, without relevance, in contradiction to even what the Patriot Act says, your records are being collected. The second highest court in the land has said this is illegal and the president does nothing. The president says to Congress, oh yeah, I'll do it if Congress will do it. Well, it's a bit disingenuous, Mr. President. You know, we didn't start the program. The, the authors of the Patriot Act had no idea this was going on. And the Patriot Act, according to the court, doesn't even justify this. So we're looking at telephone records, we're looking at email records. EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, has another big complaint about this, that people were put forward and then told that they couldn't even talk about the fact that they'd been given a warrant. They were threatened with five years in prison for even mentioning that they'd been served a warrant. This, I think, is an obvious contradiction to the First Amendment. So we have legislation that contradicts the Fourth and the First Amendment. The national security letters in three years, from 2003 to 2005, these are the warrants that are written by FBI agents, not written by a judge. There was 143,000 warrants given out in our country to Americans without a warrant, with a warrant written by the police. The New York Times has talked about this, and Charlie Savage in a report last year reported that the Justice Department had to apologize to a federal appeals court for providing inaccurate information about a central issue in a case challenging the constitutionality. Now, what is truth and what isn't truth? When you go to a court, it's like when your kids fight. There's two sides to everything. One child has one argument, and the other child's got the other argument. The truth is listening to both sides and trying to figure out what the truth is. The court is no different. But in these courts, you're only hearing one side. Only the government represents their case. So if the government says that we want all of the phone records because they're relevant, no one stands up on the other side and says, I object. That's one of the reforms that Senator Wyden and I have talked about, is having somebody represent the accused, somebody to stand up and say, maybe all the phone records in the country are not relevant. Maybe they're not relevant to an investigation. It would be absurd to say every American would be relevant, or that every American's records would be relevant. Probably no one in America knows more about this subject than Senator Wyden, who I see has come to the floor. Senator Wyden knows more about this because he's been on the Intelligence Committee for several years. And there's two tiers within Congress. There's a great deal of information that I'm never told. Even though I was represented, elected to represent Kentucky, I'm not allowed to know a lot of things that happens in the Intelligence Committee. Now, the downside for Senator Wyden is he's allowed to know more, but then he's not allowed to talk about it, which makes it a problem because it's hard to have dissent in our country. If I'm not given the information, how can I complain about it? And if he's given information and then not allowed to complain about it. So these are the things we struggle with in trying to find truth. 
Would, uh, would the senator from uh, Kentucky yield for a question without losing his right to the floor? Yes. I thank uh, my colleague, and it is good to be back on the floor with him once again on this topic. And as we have indicated, this will not be the last time that we are back on the floor. And my colleague has made a number of very important points uh, already. I was especially pleased my colleague brought to light something that is little known, that the Attorney General of the United States is interested in, excuse me, the FBI director is interested in requiring companies to build weaknesses into their products. In other words, we have had companies interested in encryption, as my colleague has mentioned, and what's happened as a result of that encryption, they had a chance to start getting the confidence of consumers, both in the United States and worldwide, back. And then the FBI director has been interested in, in effect, requiring companies to build a back door into their systems. And this, once again, kind of defies common sense because the keys won't just be out there for the good guys. They will also be available to the bad guys. And I'm very pleased that my colleague from Kentucky highlighted one particular new development in this debate. And I have sought, as a member of the Intelligence Committee for some time, to come up with an approach that once again demonstrates that security and liberty are not mutually exclusive. We can have both, but we're certainly not going to have both, as my colleague touched on in his statement, if the policy of the FBI director is to require companies to build a back door into their products, build weaknesses into their products. Now, the senator from Kentucky is very much aware that my staff and a number of senators are currently working through a number of issues and amendments related to the question of how we can pass trade legislation and get more family wage jobs for our people through exports. And a number of us, myself specifically, have been concerned that the majority leader and other supporters a business as usual on bulk collection of all of these phone records would somehow try to take advantage of our current discussions and try to, in effect, sneak through a motion to extend Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. As long as the senator from Kentucky has the floor, that cannot happen. And my hope is once our colleagues have agreed on a path to go forward with job-creating, export-oriented trade legislation, it will be possible to resume our work on that very important bill. In the meantime, my question for my colleague pertains to an issue that he noted I have been at for some time. As my colleague knows, I have been trying to end the bulk phone record collection program since 2006. And the reason I have is that what this bulk phone record collection program is, is a federal human relations database. When the federal government knows who you've called, when you've called, and often where you have called from, which is the case certainly if somebody calls from a landline and someone has a phone book, the government's got a lot of private and inf intimate information about you. If the government knows that you called a psychiatrist three times, for example, in 36 hours, twice after midnight, the government doesn't have to be listening to that call. The government knows a whole lot about what most Americans would consider to be uh, very private. So. This has been an important issue 
My colleague from Kentucky has been an invaluable ally on this particular cause since he arrived in, uh, in the Senate. And I just want to give a little bit more uh, background and then get my colleague's reaction to this uh, question. I've seen several of my colleagues come to the floor of the Senate talking about why we ought to keep bulk phone record collection. And the statement has somehow been that this is absolutely key for strong counterterror. That is a baffling assertion, I would say to my colleague from Kentucky, because even the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General are saying that it isn't. So what we have is members of the Senate saying that bulk collection, some of them, ought to be preserved in order to fight terror, and the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General, two individuals who are not exactly soft on terror, saying that it's not. Now, if senators and those who might be following this debate are seeking a more detailed analysis, I hope that they'll check out the very lengthy report on surveillance that was issued by the President's Review Group. This group's members have some very impressive national security credentials. I mean, these are not people who are soft on fighting you know, terror. One of them was the senior counter-terror advisor to both President Clinton and President Bush. Another served as acting director of the CIA. And this review group, a review group led by individuals with pristine anti-terror credentials, said on page 104 of their report, Staff sometimes kids me. I'm sure this is the case for the senator from Kentucky because I always say page 104. I'll quote here, the information contributed to terrorist investigations by the use of section 215 bulk telephony metadata was not essential to preventing attacks and could readily have been obtained in a timely manner using individual Section 215 orders. So what this distinguished group of experts said supports what the senator from Kentucky is saying, what I and others have been saying for uh, some time. So the senator from Kentucky you know, pointed out my service on the Intelligence Committee. I think Senator Feinstein and I are two of the five longest serving members in the committee's history. We didn't find out about bulk collection until it had been underway for quite some time because it was concealed from most members of the Intelligence Committee for several years. But given the fact that we began to see in 2006 and early 2007 what's at stake, this has been a fight that has been going on for eight years. And one of the reasons, an additional reason, that I appreciate the senator from Kentucky being here now is that for these eight years and multiple reauthorizations, it's always been the same pattern. It was almost like the night follows the day. Those who are in favor of dragnet surveillance and those who are in favor of the bulk collection program, in effect, wait until the very last minute. They wait until the last minute, and then they say, oh my goodness, it is a dangerous world. We've got to continue this program just the way it is. Well, I tell my colleague from Kentucky, and I know he shares my view on this, there is no question that it is a very dangerous world. Anybody who served on the Intelligence Committee, as I have for more than 14 years, and goes in to those classified meetings you know, weekly, does not walk out of there with 
without the judgment that it is a very dangerous you know, world. But what doesn't make sense is to be pursuing approaches that don't make us safer and compromise our liberties. That's what doesn't make sense. And so last year, along with my colleagues, Senator Heinrich and Senator Mark Udall, I filed a brief in a case that was before the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. It's an important court, one of the highest in our country. In the brief, we said, and I quote, we have reviewed this surveillance extensively and have seen no evidence that the bulk collection of Americans' phone records has provided any intelligence of value that could not have been gathered through means that caused far less harm to the privacy interests of millions of Americans. And I'd say to my colleague, what we are talking about are, in effect, conventional approaches with respect to court orders, and then there are emergency circumstances. Emergency circumstances, so when the government believes it has got to act to protect the American people, it can move quickly and then, in effect, come back and settle up uh, later. But the conclusion that we reached after reviewing bulk collection very carefully was based on eight years' worth of work. And, of course, we've recently had this court declare bulk collection to be illegal. So my question, my first question, is does the senator from Kentucky agree that there is no evidence that dragnet surveillance now makes America any safer? Well, I think it's a great question, and I think it's also very difficult to prove these things one way or another sometimes, and we're at a great disadvantage because a lot of times they hold all of the information. So I think it was nothing short of miraculous that you and others were able to investigate this and show that in reality, all of these folks that they allege could have been caught, would have been caught through traditional surveillance, through traditional warrants. And I think this is a, a pretty important point because they want us to live in fear and give up the Fourth Amendment, but it turns out even the practical argument isn't an accurate one because it turns out that almost always, if not always, the terrorists seem to be caught through sort of the normal channels of human intelligence, suspicion, you know, finding something out about them that causes us to investigate them. And I, like the senator from Oregon, do want to catch terrorists. And I also want to keep our freedom at the same time. And I think it was a pretty important conclusion, not only by the review board, but also by the, um, you know, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board as well, the review panel, two groups of uh, folks from the administration. And one question uh, that I would be interested in also from the senator from Oregon is, in an op-ed in December, uh, Senator Wyden wrote in the LA Times that building a backdoor into every cell phone, tablet, or laptop means deliberately creating weaknesses that hackers and foreign governments can exploit. Um, but I would be interested in entertaining a question concerning that. I apologize to, to my colleague. Could, could my colleague just restate that briefly? This was in an op-ed that was written by the senator from Oregon in uh, LA Times in December. And I'm quoting from the op-ed. It says, building a back door into every cell phone, tablet, or laptop means deliberately creating weaknesses that hackers and foreign governments can exploit. And I think expanding upon that in the form of a question, I think would uh, help us to understand exactly what you mean by that. What the senator is asking about is a statement made by the FBI director, Mr. Comey, and it was not some hidden kind of articles on the front pages of all our papers, that really deserves, as my colleague is suggesting, some consideration. In fact, one of the last things I did as chairman of the 
Senate Finance Committee had a relatively short tenure there in 2014 was to hold a workshop in Silicon Valley on this issue. And the problem stems from the fact that with the NSA overreach taking a huge toll on our companies and the confidence that consumers both here and around the world had in the privacy of their products, these companies said we've got to figure out a way to make sure that consumers here and around the world understand that we are going to protect their privacy. So they decided to put in place products that had strong encryption. They felt that that was important to be able to assure uh, their consumers that uh, when uh, they sold something that their privacy rights were protected. And in doing so, of course, they also made it clear that as has always been the case, when the government believes that an individual could put our nation at risk, you get an individual court order, you use emergency uh, circumstances, and you could still get access to uh, information. And the response by our government, which contributed mightily to the problem by the NSA's overreach in the first place, was our government saying, nope, you're not going to be able to use that encryption to bring back the confidence that Americans have in your products and people around the world. And there were projections, I would tell my colleague, that these companies were already losing billions and billions of dollars in terms of the consequences of loss of privacy, the response of the government was to say, we are looking at requiring you to build weaknesses in your products and in effect create a back door so we can get easy entry. And I know at town hall meetings at home in Oregon, I've talked about the concept of our government requiring companies to build weaknesses in their products. And people just slap their forehead. They say, what's that all about? It's your job to make sure that we have policies that both secure uh, our liberty and keep us safe. It's not your job to tell companies to build weaknesses into your products. In effect, you're going to just throw up your hands and say, we can't do it. So the company ought to build weaknesses in the products. And as my colleague said, uh, I uh, pointed out that once you do that, it won't just be the good guys who will have the keys. It'll be bad guys who have the keys at a time when we are so concerned about cybersecurity. Might I ask my colleague another question on uh, one other topic? He and I have talked about it at great length. Is the senator from Kentucky troubled? by the fact that a number of high-ranking intelligence officials have not been forthright in recent years with respect to this bulk collection and the collecting of data on millions or hundreds of mil millions of Americans. My colleague knows I've been particularly troubled by this. And I ask the question because my colleague and I have pointed out that we have enormous admiration for the rank and file in the intelligence field. These are individuals who day in and day out get up in the morning and contribute enormously to the well-being of the American people. And we have enormous respect for them. We are grateful to them. They are patriots and they serve us every day well. I personally do not think they have been well served by the fact that a host of high-level intelligence officials have not exactly been straight or forthright with the Congress and the American people on these issues. And I would be interested in my colleagues' view on that because we have discussed this at, at some length, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to put it in the context of making sure that Americans know that the two of us greatly respect the thousands of people who work in the intelligence field, serve us well, do the things that are necessary to apprehend and kill bin Laden. 
but that we are concerned about the question of the veracity, the uh, forthrightness of some of the members of the intelligence community at the highest levels. What's my, my colleague's uh, reaction to that? I think the vast majority of the intelligence community, like the vast majority of policemen, are good people trying to do what's best for the country. They're patriotic people, and they're uh, really trying to do things within the confines of the law. But the thing is, is that the intelligence community has such vast power, and a lot of it's secret power. So you have to have a great deal of trust for those who run the agency, because we've entrusted them with such enormous power to look through information that if we lose the trust at the top, then when they come to us and say, well, you have to give up a little more liberty, you have to give up a little bit more in order to get security, we have to trust the information because they control all the information they give us and that we find when you ask a high-ranking official in the committee whether or not they were doing bulk collection of data and the answer was not true, that they said we weren't doing something that we obviously are doing, it makes us distrust the whole, the whole apparatus. But I agree with you that the vast majority of law enforcement, intelligence community, they're good people, patriotic. They want to stop terrorism. We all do. But what we're arguing about is the process and the law and the Constitution and trying to do it within the confines of the Constitution. But when you have someone at the very top who doesn't tell the truth in a uh, open hearing under oath, that's very troubling and makes it difficult. I appreciate uh, my colleague's assessment of that, and he knows that it was very troubling that in 2012 and 2013, we just weren't able to get straight answers to this question of collecting data on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans. As my colleague will recall, uh, the former NSA director said that he had been to a conference and that he was not involved in collecting dossiers on millions of Americans. And having been on the committee at that point for over a dozen years, I said, gee, I'm not exactly sure what a dossier means in that context. So we began to ask questions both public ones, to the extent you could, and private ones about exactly what that meant. And we couldn't get answers to those questions. Just couldn't get answers. So the Intelligence Committee traditionally doesn't have many open hearings. By my calculus, we probably get to ask questions in an open hearing for maybe 20 minutes maximum a year. So after months and months of trying to find out exactly what was meant, we felt it was important to ask the Director of National Intelligence exactly what it was meant by these dossiers and the government collecting data and the like. So at our open hearing, I said I'm going to have to ask the Director of National Intelligence about it. And because I've long felt that it was important not to try to trick people or ambush them or anything of the sort, we sent the question in advance to the head of national intelligence. We sent the exact question, does the government collect any type of data at all on millions of Americans? And we asked it so that he would have plenty of time to reflect on it. And we waited to see if the director got back and said, please don't ask it. There's always been a kind of informal you know, tradition in the Intelligence Committee, being respectful of that. We didn't get that request. So I asked it. And the director said, when I asked, does the government collect any type of data at all on millions of Americans, 
The director said no. And I knew that that wasn't accurate. That was not a forthright, straightforward, truthful answer. So we asked for a correction. Couldn't get a correction. I would say to my colleague, since that time, the director or his representatives have given five different reasons why they responded as they did, further raising questions in my mind with respect not to the rank and file in the intelligence community, the thousands and thousands of hardworking members of the intelligence community that my colleague and I uh, feel so strongly about and respect so greatly. So I'd like to ask just one other question with respect to where we are at, at this point and what's ahead. As long as the senator from Kentucky holds the floor, no one would be able to offer a motion to consider an extension of the USA Patriot Act. But at some point in the near future, whether it's this weekend or next week or next month, my analysis is the proponents of bulk phone record collection are going to seek a vote in the Senate to continue what I consider to be this invasion of privacy of millions and millions of law-abiding Americans. When that happens, I intend to use every procedural tool available to me to block that extension. And at least 40, and if at least 41 senators stand together, we can block that extension and block it indefinitely. If 41 senators stick together, there isn't going to be any short-term extension. And finally, after something like eight years of working on this issue, finally, we will be saying no to bulk phone record collection. I'm certain I know the answer to this question, but I think we both want to be on the record on this matter. When that vote comes, the senator is going to be one of the 41 uh, senators who is going to block that extension. I've appreciated his leadership, and I would just like his reaction to our efforts to go forward once again when we have to uh, do it with proponents of mass surveillance seeking an actual vote to continue business as usual with respect to dragnet surveillance. I think the American people are with us. I think the American people don't like the idea of the bulk collection. I think the American people are horrified, and I think it will go down in history as one of the most important questions we've asked in a generation when you ask the Director of National Intelligence, are you gathering bulk, are you gathering in bulk the phone records of Americans? And when he didn't tell the truth, and then when the President kept him in office, and how this led to this great debate we're having now. I think the American people are with us. I don't think uh, that those inside Washington are listening very well. So I think those inside Washington have not come to the conclusion yet. But I think you're right. There may be enough of us now to say, hey, wait a minute. You're not going to steamroll through once again something that really isn't even doing what you said it was going to do. No one said at the time of the Patriot Act that it meant we could collect all the records of all the Americans all the time. In fact, in the House, one of the co-sponsors of the bill, James Sensenbrenner, he knew all about the Patriot Act. He was a proponent of the Patriot Act, and he said never in his wildest dreams did what he vote for, did he ever think that that would say that we could gather all the records all the time. But I am interested in one, another question, and this would be whether the senator from Oregon has a question that will help us better to understand if we were to stop bulk collection tomorrow, if we were going to eliminate what's called Section 215 of the Patriot Act, 
If we were to do that, is there still concern and worry about what's called executive order? What's called executive order 12333? And I'm not aware of whether you can or can't talk about this or what is public. From what I have read in public and from what um, one of the insightful articles was from John Napier Tai, the chief for the Internet Freedom and the State Department Bureau, has written that his concern is that this executive order may well allow a lot of bulk collection that is not justified and not given sanction under the Patriot Act. If you have a question that might help the American public to understand that. I would just say to my colleague that we always have to be vigilant about secret law. And we have, in effect, found our way in this ominous cul-de-sac that you and I have been describing here this afternoon, really because of secret law. And I want the American people, as I wrap up with this question, hear my colleagues' concern about it, because I think that's what is at the heart of his question, that secret law is what the interpretation is in the intelligence community of the laws written by the Congress, and very, very often those secret interpretations are very different than what an American will read if they use their iPad or their, their laptop. For example, on Section 215, bulk phone record uh, collection, I don't think very many people in Kentucky or Oregon sat and took out their laptop and read the Patriot Act and said, oh, that authorizes collecting all the phone records on millions of law-abiding Americans. There's nothing that even suggests something like that, but that was a secret interpretation. So I am very glad that the senator from Kentucky has chosen to have us wrap up at least this part of our uh, discussion with the questions that we have directed to each other on this question of secret law. Because as my colleague from Kentucky and I have talked about, we both feel that operations of the intelligence community, what are called sources and methods, they absolutely have to be secret and classified, because if they're not, Americans could die. Patriotic Americans who work in the intelligence community could suffer grievous harm if sources and methods and the actual operations were in some way leaked to the public. But the law should never be secret. The American people should always know what the law means, and yet, with respect to bulk collection and why that court decision was so important, what happened was a program that had been kept secret, that had been propped up by secret law, was declared illegal by an important court. So I will just wrap up by way of saying that the senator from Kentucky and I have always done a little kidding over the years about our informal Ben Franklin caucus. Ben Franklin always talking about how anybody who gave up their liberty to have security really didn't deserve either. And I just want to tell my colleague that I'm very appreciative of his involvement in this from the time that my colleague came to the Senate. He has been a very valuable ally in this effort. And my colleague recognized this was not about balance, this program. This is a program that doesn't make us safer, but compromises our liberty. It's not about balance. And at page 104, you can read that the president's own advisors say that. So I'm very pleased that the informal Ben Franklin caucus is back in action this afternoon. I look forward to working closely with my colleague on this. And as I indicated by my question, I expect we'll be back on the floor of this 
wonderful body here before long having to once again tackle this question of whether it ought to be just business as usual and re-up of a flawed law. And my colleague and I aren't going to accept that. And I thank him for his work, uh, work today, these uh, discussions and being on your feet hour after hour, not for the faint-hearted. And I appreciate my colleague's leadership. And I once again yield the floor back to him. Well, Mr. President, I would like to thank the uh, Senator from Oregon, and I'd also like to point out to the American people that people are always crying out and they were saying, why can't you work together? Why can't you work with the other side? And I think we have a false understanding sometimes of compromise. The Senator from Oregon is from the opposite party. We are on two opposite parties, and we don't agree on every issue. But when it comes to privacy and the Bill of Rights and what we need to do to protect the Fourth Amendment, we're not splitting the difference to try to find a middle ground between us. We both believe in the Fourth Amendment. We both believe in protecting the Fourth Amendment and protecting your right to privacy. So bipartisanship can be about two people believing in the same thing, just being in different parties. And it means we may not believe on 100% of issues, but on a few, we're exactly together. And we don't split the difference. It isn't always about splitting the difference. You can have true, healthy bipartisanship, Republican, Democrat, independent, coming together about a constitutional principle, coming together about something that's important. And I didn't come to the floor today because, you know, I want to get, uh, you know, some money for one individual project for one person. I came because I want something for everybody. I want freedom for everybody, and I want the protection of the individual I want protection uh, against the government's invasion into your privacy. And so I thank the senator from Oregon for his uh, insightful questions. One of the things that uh, we talked a little bit about as uh, Senator Wyden and I were going through a series of questions, was some of the different boards that have been um, put in place by the president and uh, have come out with and said that the program, uh, the executive order... The president put in place two sort of panels, a, a review panel, and then another one called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. And interestingly, both panels told him the same thing, that what he was doing was illegal and wrong, and it ought to stop. And then the president will come out and say, that's great, but then he just keeps doing it. So I don't, I don't quite understand, because I like the president, and I take him at his word, and he says, well, yes, I'm balancing this and that, and they told me this, and yes, if Congress stops it, I'll obey Congress. It's like, we didn't start this. The president started this program by himself. He didn't tell us about it. Maybe one or two people knew about it. Almost all of your representatives didn't know about it, and no Americans knew about it. And then when we asked them about it, they lied to us and said they weren't doing it. So the president has two official panels, and they both say it's illegal and ought to stop. And that the Patriot Act, even the Patriot Act, doesn't justify what they're doing. And that this was all created by executive order. So what is the president's response? He just keeps collecting your records. Does nobody in America think that this is strange or unusual? That the president will continue a program that his own advisors tell him is illegal, that the courts have now said is illegal, and he goes on. But this isn't all one-sided. That's, on, that's for one political party. But in my political party, there are people saying, hmm, well, I guess the president's advisors say it's illegal. The court says it's illegal. But man, they're not collecting enough. I just wish they were collecting more of Americans' records without a warrant. What a bizarre world that people don't seem to be listening either to the courts, to the experts, or to the Constitution. The Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, though, I think uh, really had some insightful comments here. 
they give a description, first of all, of collecting all of your phone records. And I like the way they put it. They said that an order was given such that the NSA is to collect nearly all call detail records generated by certain telephone companies in the United States. Sometimes you read the sentence, you don't quite get to the importance. Nearly all. So we're not talking about a thousand records. We're not about talking about a million records. We're, not, we're talking about nearly all of the records in the entire United States. There's, there's probably over 100 million phones, I would think, in the United States. I'm talking about 100 million records. Every record's got thousands of uh, pieces of information in it. So we're talking about billions of bits of information that the government's collecting. And I don't have a problem if they want to collect the phone data of terrorists. In fact, I want them to. I don't have a problem if they will go 100 hops into the data if they've got a warrant. If John Doe's a warrant, look at all his phone records. Ask a judge, put his name on the warrant, look at all of his records. If the 100 people that he called, there are people that you have suspicion on, call them too. I mean, uh, get a warrant for them, go into the next hop, go into the next hop. There's no limit, but just do it appropriately, do it appropriately with uh, a warrant, with somebody's name on it. I see no reason why we can't do this with the Constitution. We are now collecting the records of hundreds of millions of people without a warrant. And I think it needs to stop. The president's own commission says it should stop. Here's what the commission said. From 2001 through early 2006, the NSA collected bulk data based on a presidential authorization. So interestingly, and this ought to scare you too, they didn't even use the Patriot Act in the beginning at all. The president just wrote a note to the, the head of the NSA and said, just start collecting all their stuff without any kind of warrant. And then later on, they started saying, well, maybe the Patriot Act justifies this. But for five years, they collected data with no warrant and with no legal justification. And they do it through something they call the inherent powers of the president, Article II powers. The Article II is a section of the Constitution that gives the president powers. We designate what the president can do. Article I designates what we can do. Interestingly, our framers put Article I first, and those of us in Congress think that maybe they thought the powers of Congress were closer to the people and more important, and they gave delegated powers to us, and they were very, very specific. But what concerns me about the bulk collection is that for five years it wasn't even done with regard to the Patriot Act. I'm guessing it was done under the executive order. So as much as I don't like the Patriot Act and I would like to repeal the Patriot Act and simply use the Constitution, I'm afraid that even if we repeal the Patriot Act, they'd still do what they want. Your governments have run amok. Things are run away and the government really is not paying attention to the rule of law. For the first time in 2006, is when the court got involved. The intelligent court at that time finally gives the first order under section 215. So for five years, they were collecting all the phone records with just a presidential order. Now we do it under the Patriot Act. But the rule of law is about checks and balances. It's about balancing the executive branch and the legislative branch, the judiciary branch. It's about balancing the police and the judiciary. We talked about warrants and the police not writing warrants. And I see on the floor one of probably the nation's leading experts in the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution, who's recently written a book on this. And I was, uh, I've told him recently, I've, I've, I've been stealing his story and at least half the time giving his credit for it. But I talked earlier on the floor about the story of John Wilkes and uh, if the senator from Utah is interested in, in telling us a little bit of the story, we'd probably like to hear a little bit from his angle or in the form of a question, any other question he has. Let me clear, be clear at the outset that while the senator from Kentucky and I come to different conclusions with regard to the specific question as to whether we should allow Section 215 of the Patriot Act to expire, 
I absolutely stand with the junior senator from Kentucky, and more importantly, I stand with the American people. With regard to the need for a transparent, open amendment process and for an open, honest debate in front of the American people on the important issues facing our nation, including this one. And I certainly agree with the senator from Kentucky that the American people deserve better than what they're getting. And quite frankly, it's time that they expect more from the United States Senate. On issues important as this one, on issues as important as the right to privacy of our citizens and our national security, this is not time for more cliffs, more secrecy, and more 11th hour backroom deals that are designed amidst conflict, uh, amidst crisis, in a previously arranged time crunch in which the American people are presented with something where they don't really have any real options. It's time for the kind of bipartisan, bicameral consensus that I believe is embodied in the USA Freedom Act. And while I often criticize Congress for our economic deficits, our financial deficits, the core of this current challenge we face is centered around the Congress's deficit of trust. And in this particular circumstance, the Senate's deficit of trust. Members of our body routinely tell the American people to just trust us. Just trust us, we'll get it right. Just trust us, we'll appropriately balance all the competing concerns. And I think it's time that we trust the American people by having an honest discussion with them emanating from right here on the floor of the United States Senate. It's time to discuss and to debate and to amend the House-passed USA Freedom Act. I'm confident that Senator Paul and others among my colleagues who have different ideas from mine will be happy to offer and debate amendments to improve it and to make it something perhaps that they could even support. In fact, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, Senator Paul and others have amendments that they're eager and anxious and willing and ready to present and to have discussed here on the floor and voted on right here on the floor of the United States Senate. So first, I'm calling on my Republican and Democratic colleagues to help repair the dysfunctional legislative branch we've inherited to rebuild the Senate's reputation as not only our nation's but the world's greatest deliberative body and by extension, slowly restore the public's confidence in who we are and what we're here to do here in the United States Senate. The greatest challenge to policymaking today is perhaps distrust. The American people distrust their government, and they distrust Congress in particular, and it's not without reason. For their part, Washington policymakers seem to distrust the people. And almost as pressing for the, for the new majority here in the United States Senate, the distrust that now exists between grassroots conservative activists and elected Republican leaders can be particularly toxic. Leaders can respond to this kind of distrust in one of two ways. One option involves the bare-knuckled kind of partisanship that the previous Senate leadership exhibited over the last eight years, twisting rules, blocking debate, and blocking amendments while systematically disenfranchising hundreds of millions of Americans from meaningful political representation right here in this chamber. But this is no choice at all. Contempt for the American people and for the democratic process is something Republicans should oppose in principle. And in fact, it is something we oppose in principle. We should throw open the doors of Congress, throw open the doors of the Senate, and restore genuine representative democracy to the American Republic. What does this mean? Well, it means no more cliff crises, no more secret negotiations, no more take it or leave it deadline deals, no more passing bills without reading them, no more procedural manipulation to block debate and compromise. These are the abuses that have created today's status quo, the very same status quo that Republicans have been elected to correct. What too few in Washington appreciate, and what the new Republican majority in Congress 
must appreciate if we hope to succeed is that the American people's distrust of their public institutions is totally justified. There is no misunderstanding here. Americans are fed up with Washington, and, and they have every right to be. The exploitive status quo in Washington has corrupted Americans' economy and their government, and its entrenched defenders, powerful and sometimes rich in the process. This situation was created by both parties, but repairing it is now going to fall to those of us in this body right now. It's our job to win back the public's trust. And that can't be done simply by passing bills, or even better bills. The only way to gain trust is to be trustworthy. I think that means that we have to invite the people back into the process, to give the bills we do pass the moral legitimacy that Congress alone no longer confers. So in order to restore this trust, members will have to expose themselves to inconvenient amendment votes, inconvenient debate and discussion and scrutiny of legislation that we're considering. The results of some votes and the fates of certain bills may indeed prove unpredictable, but the costs of an open source transparent process are worth it for the benefits of greater inclusion and more diverse voices and views and for the opportunity such a process would offer to rebuild the internal and the external trust needed to govern, needed to govern with legitimacy. My friend and colleague, the junior senator from Kentucky, has referred to a story of which I've become quite fond, a story that I've written about and talked about in various venues throughout my state and throughout America. It relates to a lawmaker, a lawmaker who served several hundred years ago, a lawmaker named John Wilkes. Not to be confused with John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin. This John Wilkes served in English Parliament in the late 1700s. In 1763, John Wilkes found himself at the receiving end of anger and resentment by the administration of King George III. King George III and his ministers were angry with John Wilkes. You see, because at, at the time, there were these weekly news circulars, weekly news magazines that went out and would often just extol the virtues of King George III and his ministers. One of them was called The Briton. The Briton was, ri was written and produced and published by those who were loyal to the king, and they would say only glowing things about the king. They would write things about the king saying, oh, the king is fantastic, the king can do no wrong. Had sliced bread been invented as of 1763, I'm sure the Briton would have reported that the king was the greatest thing since sliced bread. That's all they could say were nice things about the king because they were written by the king's people. Well, John Wilkes decided to buck that trend and he started his own weekly circular called the North Britain. The North Britain took a different angle. The North Britain took the angle that it was supposed to be in the interest of the people that he reported the news and that he made commentary. And so in the North Britain, John Wilkes would occasionally be so bold as to criticize or question King George III and the actions of him and uh, of the king and, and of the king's ministers. Now, this proved problematic for some in the administration of King George III. The last straw seemed to come with the publication of the 45th edition of the North Britain, North Britain number 45. When North Britain number 45 was released, the king and his ministers went crazy. Before long, John Wilkes found himself arrested. John Wilkes found himself subjected to a very invasive search pursuant to a particular type of warrant that had become, unfortunately, all too common in that era, a type of warrant that we'll refer to as a general warrant. Rather than naming a particular place or a particular person where things would be searched and seized, this warrant simply identified 
an offense and said go after anyone and everyone who might in some way be involved in it. It gave unfettered, unlimited discretion to those executing and enforcing this warrant as to how and where and with respect to whom this warrant might be executed. And so they went through his house, even though he wasn't named in the warrant, even though his home, his address were not identified in the warrant, they searched through everything. John Wilkes was understandably outraged by this, as were people throughout the city of London when they became aware of it. John Wilkes, while in jail, decided that he was going to fight back. He fought in open court the terms and the conditions of his arrest, and he ended up fighting against this general warrant. He eventually won his freedom, and over time, he was re-elected repeatedly to Parliament. In time, he also brought a civil suit against King George III's ministers who were involved in the execution of this general warrant, and he won. He was awarded 4,000 pounds, which was a very substantial sum of money at the time. And the other people who were subjected to the same type of search under the same general warrant were also awarded a, a recovery under this same theory. To the point that in present day terms, there were many millions of dollars that had to be paid out by King George III and his ministers to the plaintiffs who sued under this theory that they were unlawfully subjected to a search under a general warrant. In time, the number 45, in connection with uh, uh, the North Britain number 45, the publication that had sparked this whole inquiry, the number 45 became synonymous with the name John Wilkes. And the name John Wilkes, in turn, became synonymous with the cause of liberty. People throughout Britain and throughout America would celebrate the cause of freedom by celebrating the number 45. It was not uncommon for people to buy drinks for their 45 closest friends. It was not uncommon for them to write the number 45 on the side of buildings, taverns, saloons. It was not uncommon for the number 45 to be raised in connection with cries for the cause of liberty. So the number 45, the name John Wilkes, and the cause of liberty all became wrapped up into one. And it was against this backdrop that the United States was becoming its own nation. When it did become its own nation, when we adopted a constitution, and when we decided shortly thereafter to adopt a Bill of Rights, one of the very first amendments we adopted was the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment responded to this particular call for freedom by guaranteeing that in the United States we would not have general warrants. The Fourth Amendment makes that clear. It contains a particularity requirement stating that any persons or things subjected to a search warrant would have to be described with particularity. The persons would have to be identified or at least an area or, or a set of objects would have to be identified, rather than the government just saying, go after anyone and everyone that might be connected with this offense or, or with this series of events. At that time, there were no such thing as telephones. Those wouldn't come along for a very long time. They certainly didn't imagine, could, and could not have imagined, the type of communications devices that we have today. Nevertheless, the principles that they embraced at the time are still valid today. They're still relevant today. The principles embodied in the Fourth Amendment are still very much applicable today. And the freedom that we embraced then is still embraced today by the American people, who, when they become aware of it, tend to be offended by the notion that the NSA can go out and get an order that requires the providers of telephone services to just give up all of their data, give up all of their calling records, to give those over to a government agency who will then put them into a database and keep track of where everyone's telephone calls have gone. The idea behind this program is to build and maintain a database 
storing information regarding each call you have made and each call that has been made to you, what time each call occurred and how long it lasted. This is an extraordinary amount of information. Information that, while perhaps relatively innocuous in small pieces, when put together in a single database, one that includes potentially more than 300 million Americans, one that goes back five years at a time, can be used or could easily be abused in such a way that would allow the government to paint a, a, a painfully clear portrait, a silhouette of every American. Some researchers have suggested, for example, that through metadata alone, it could be ascertained how old you are, what your political views are, your religious affiliation, what activities you engage in, the condition of your health, and all other kinds of personal information. One of the reasons this is distressing is that unlike a program that would involve listening to the content of your telephone calls, which of course is, is not an issue with respect to this program, all of this can be done with a high degree of automation, such that those intent on abusing it could do so with relative ease with the type of ease that they wouldn't have access to absent this type of automation. Now, sometimes people are inclined to ask, where is the evidence that this particular program is being abused? What can you point to that suggests that anyone has used this for nefarious political purposes or for some other illegitimate purpose not connected with protecting American national security? I've got a few responses to that. First and foremost, we do need to look to the Constitution, both to the letter and spirit of that founding document that has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. It is important for its own sake, simply because we have taken an oath to uphold, protect, and defend it as members of this body. The Constitution is an end unto itself. And it's important that we follow it, regardless of whether we can point to some particular respect in which this particular program has been abused. Secondly, even if we assume, even if we stipulate for purposes of this discussion, that no one within the NSA is currently abusing this program for nefarious political purposes or otherwise, even if we assume that no one within the NSA currently is even capable of abusing or, or has any inclination to abuse this program at any point in the future. I would ask the question, can we say that we're certain that that will always be the case? Who's to say what might happen a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 10 or 15 years from now? We know, Mr. President, how these things happen. We understand something about human nature. We understand what happens to human beings as soon as they get a little bit of power. They tend to abuse it. Remember the investigation brought about by Senator Frank Church back in the 1970s. Senator Frank Church, when he investigated wiretap abuses, abuses of a technology that was still only a few decades old back in the 1970s when this occurred, the Church Committee concluded, among other things, that every presidential administration, from FDR through Richard Nixon, had abused our nation's investigative and counterintelligence agencies for partisan political purposes, to engage in political espionage. Every single one of those administrations, from FDR to Nixon, had done that. In that sense, Mr. President, we have seen this movie before. We know how it ends. We know that even though the people working at the NSA today might well have only the noblest of intentions, over time, these kinds of programs can be abused. And we know that a lot of people in America understand the potential for this abuse. Thirdly, Mr. President, I have to point out that the NSA currently is collecting metadata only with respect to phone calls. But under the same reading of Section 215 of the Patriot Act that the NSA has used to collect this metadata, a reading with which I disagree, and a reading with which the 
U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit disagreed in its thoughtful, well-written opinion just about two weeks ago. Even though the NSA is currently collecting only telephone call metadata right now, there's nothing about the way the NSA reads Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which is incorrect, by the way, an incorrect reading, but there's nothing about that reading that would limit the NSA to collecting only metadata related to telephone calls. So who's to say that the NSA might decide tomorrow or next year or a couple years from now if we reauthorize this or at some point down the road within a period of reauthorization that the NSA won't decide at that point to begin collecting other types of metadata? Not just telephone call metadata, but perhaps credit card metadata, metadata regarding uh, people who reserve hotels online, regarding emails that people send or receive, regarding websites that people visit online, regarding online transactions that occur. Those are all different types of metadata. Now again, I, I disagree with the NSA's legal interpretation of Section 215 of the Patriot Act. I think they're abusing it. I think they are misusing it. I think they have dangerously misconstrued it, just as the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit concluded a couple weeks ago. But this is their interpretation. And if we reauthorize this, are we not, Mr. President, reauthorizing in some respects, or at least enabling them to con continue this? I don't think we're validating or ratifying uh, what, what they're doing. Their interpretation of it is still wrong. But we're enabling them to engage in a continued, ongoing practice of abuse of the plain language of Section 215, which requires that anything they collect be relevant to an investigation. Well, their interpretation of relevant to the investigation is we might at some point in the future deem this material relevant to what we might at some point in the future be investigating. That cannot plausibly, under any interpretation of the word relevance, be acceptable. And it was on that basis that the second circuit rejected the NSA's interpretation. In any event, that same interpretation will still be the NSA's interpretation if, in fact, we reauthorize this. And there's nothing stopping the NSA from using that same interpretation, mistaken interpretation, but an interpretation nonetheless of Section 215 in a way that would allow, there's nothing stopping them from using that same misinterpretation of the statutory language for the purposes of gathering metadata on credit card usage, on online activity, on emails sent and received. And from that, Mr. President, you can discern even more information about a person's profile. You can come up with a really frighteningly accurate picture of anyone based on that kind of metadata, just as you can now. But that would give them an even clearer picture. That would be an even greater affront to the privacy interests of the American people. All of this relates back to the idea that the government shouldn't be able to go out and say, here's a court order. We want all of your information. We want all of your data. Just give it to us, because we might want it later. This type of dragnet operation is incompatible with our legal system. It's incompatible with hundreds of years of Anglo-American legal precedent. It's incompatible with the spirit, if not the letter, of the United States Constitution. And it's not something that we should embrace. At the end of the day, we need to do something with this program. Not everyone in this chamber agrees on what that something is. And not everyone in this chamber who believes that we need reform, who believes that the NSA's program of bulk metadata collection is wrong, agrees on the same solution. But the way for us to get to a solution must involve open, transparent debate and discussion. And it absolutely should involve an open amendment process. So if there are those who have concerns with the legislation passed by the House of Representatives last week by a vote of 338 to 88, I welcome their input. I welcome any amendments they may have. I welcome the opportunity to make the bill better, to make it more compatible with this or that interest, to make it do a better job of balancing the privacy and national security interests at stake. But we have to have that debate and discussion. And we have to have that process in order for the American people to be well represented and well served. We cannot continue to function
by cliff. Government by cliff is a recipe for disaster. Government by cliff results in a take it or leave it, one size fits all, binary set of choices that disserve the American people. Government by cliff all too frequently results in temporary extensions rather than some type of lasting legislative solution that can help the American people feel more comfortable that they are being well represented. And so I would ask my distinguished colleague, my friend, the junior senator from Kentucky, if there are not ways in which we could come to an agreement on this, if we as a body couldn't come to an agreement on how best to resolve this difficult circumstance, if the cause of protecting American national security is irreconcilably in conflict with the privacy interests that are part of the Fourth Amendment. And most importantly, I would ask my friend from Kentucky if privacy isn't in fact part of our security rather than being in conflict with it. I'd be interested in any thoughts my friend from Kentucky might have on that issue. Well, Mr. President, the uh, senator from Utah makes uh, a very good point and also asks some very good questions. In saying that we tend to work against deadlines here, I often say we lurch from deadline to deadline, and the American people wonder, what the heck have we been doing in between the deadlines? The Patriot Act has been due to expire for three years. It's on a sunset of three years. So we knew three years ago that this date was coming. There should be plenty of time, and I think adequate time, particularly to discuss issues that affect the Bill of Rights, that affect uh, rights that were you know, encoded into our Constitution from the very beginning. So I think without question, the issue is of great importance and that we should debate it. But too often, budgetary measures, or maybe this measure, get so crowded up against deadlines that people are like, oh, we don't have time for amendments. The problem is if you don't have amendments, you're not really having debate. And I think the senator characterized very well that we both agree that the bulk collection of data is wrong. We think that that goes against the spirit and the letter of the Constitution. However, at least half of us that we will encounter in this body don't even agree with that supposition. They believe, as many of them have pointed out, we're not collecting enough, and they don't care how we collect it, let's just collect more. So we are on different sides of opinion, two groups here. And then some of us aren't exactly on the same page as to the solution, but we agree on the problem. I think you could work through to the solution if you all agreed that it's a problem and that the American people think we've gone too far, and I think that's what the purpose of some of this debate today is, is hopefully to draw the American public in and have them call their legislators and say, enough's enough. You shouldn't be collecting my data unless you suspect me of a crime, unless my name is on the warrant, unless you've had a judge sign the warrant for me. You shouldn't be collecting, collecting all the data of all Americans all the time. And I think part of our problem is the deadlines. And part of the reason I'm here today is that I've been working on you know, five or six amendments for a year now with Senator Wyden. So we have bipartisan support for a series of amendments. These are what we think would be best to fix this problem. Certainly, when we've had three years to wait for this moment, we ought to have enough time to vote on five or six amendments. You know? And so that's really, I think, what we're asking of the leadership of both sides is permission, because really in this body, everybody's got to agree to let you vote on something where no votes happen. We have done a better job this year. We are voting on more amendments, but this is still one of those occasions where we're butting up against a deadline, and my fear is that without extraordinary measures, which I'm hopefully trying to do today, that we may not get vote on amendments and we may not get adequate time to debate this, I think, important issue. Some of the uh, amendments that uh, we've been interested in presenting as a way to fix this. So first you have to agree to what the problem is. We think the problem is that the government shouldn't collect all of your phone records all of the time 
without putting your name on a warrant, without telling a judge that they have suspicion that you've committed a crime. We think that collecting everyone's phone records all the time without suspicion is sort of like a general warrant. It's like a writ of assistance. It's like what James Otis fought against. It's what John Adams said was the spark that led to the American Revolution. So we think that the American people also believe this, that the American people believe that their records shouldn't be collected in bulk, that there should not be this enormous gathering of our records. What we need to do is get to a consensus where everybody agrees that that's a problem. But the body is still divided. About half of the Senate believes that we should collect more records, that we're not invading your privacy enough, that privacy doesn't matter, that by golly, let's let the government collect all of your records to be safe. But when the Privacy Commission looked at this, when Senator Wyden looked at this, and with other people who have the intimate knowledge looked at this, their conclusion was that the bulk collection of our records, this invasion of privacy, isn't even working that we aren't capturing terrorists that we wouldn't have caught otherwise by this information. So even the practical argument that says, we'll give up our privacy to keep us safe, even that argument's not a valid argument. But we've been looking at some of the possible solutions for this, and I see uh, the senator from New Mexico, and we'd be glad to entertain a question if he has a question. Uh, yes, I want to thank my friend from Kentucky. and. Uh, ask him if he would to yield for a question without losing his right to the floor. And, uh, and I want to start out just by prefacing this for a few minutes. Uh, from my limited experience just over the past a uh, little over two years on the Intelligence Committee now, I want to start by saying that there's simply no question that our nation's intelligence professionals are incredibly dedicated patriotic men and women who make real sacrifices to keep our country safe and free. And in that, they should be able to do their jobs secure in the knowledge that their agencies have the confidence of the American people. And Congress, those of us here, need to preserve the ability of those agencies to collect information that is truly necessary to guard against real threats to our national security. The framers of the Constitution, as my, my colleague from Kentucky knows, declared that government officials had no power, no power to seize the records of individual Americans without evidence of wrongdoing. And it was so important that they literally enshrined and embedded this principle in the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. In my view, the bulk collection of Americans private telephone records by the NSA in this program clearly violates the spirit, if not the letter, of the framers' intentions here. You know, just six months after my first Senate intelligence briefing, former National Security Agency contractor Edward Snowden leaked documents that exposed the NSA's massive collection of American cell phone and internet data. And as my friend from Kentucky said, not just a few Americans, literally millions of innocent Americans caught up in what is effectively a dragnet program. And it was made clear to the public that the government had convinced the FISA court to accept a sweeping reinterpretation of Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which ignited, a, in my view, a very necessary and long overdue public conversation about the trade-offs made by our government between protecting our nation and respecting our constitutional liberties. I think that well-intentioned leaders had, during the previous decade, come down decidedly on the side of national security with a willingness to sacrifice privacy protections in the process. And what became obvious was that because of our continued lack of knowledge of Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations, some within our government believed that we still needed to collect every scrap of information available in order to ensure that should we ever need it, we could query this information and track down U.S.-based threats. In doing so, the government ended up collecting billions of call data records linked 
in case after case after case, not to terrorists, but linked to innocent Americans. Wisconsin Republican Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner, who I served with in the House of Representatives, who was one of the authors of the original underlying legislation, the Patriot Act itself, said a couple of years ago, the Patriot Act would never, or never would have passed, never would have passed had there been any inclination at all that would, it would have authorized bulk collections, end quote. As this debate increasingly moved to the public sphere, I joined my colleagues on the Intelligence Committee Senator Wyden, who was just here on the floor a few minutes ago, and former Senator Mark Udall, in pressing the NSA and the Director of National Intelligence for some clear examples in which the bulk information collected under this metadata program, under Section 215, was uniquely responsible for the capture of a terrorist or the thwarting of a terrorist plot. They could not provide any, not a single solitary example. Nor could they make a case for why the government had to hold this data for so long and why it needed, uh, why it had to hold the data itself and for so long. Thankfully, a review panel set up by President Obama agreed with us and recommended that the government end its bulk collection of telephone metadata. I'll admit, however, and my, my friend from Kentucky has brought this up on several occasions already, that I am incredibly disappointed that the President hasn't simply used his existing authority to unilaterally roll back some of the unnecessary blanket metadata collection. Some have claimed that this inaction is evidence that the President secretly supports maintaining the current program as is. That, however, is nonsense. The President has asked Congress to give him additional authorities so that he can carry out the program in an effective manner, and the USA Freedom Act seeks to do just that. Now, the Republican-led House of Representatives last week passed that bill the USA Freedom Act, by a vote of 338 to 88, with large majorities from both parties. At a time when everyone believes we agree on nothing, large majorities of Republicans and Democrats supported that legislation. And further, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruling that the NSA is violating the law by collecting millions of Americans' phone records is even more proof that we've gone too far and need to recalibrate and, in my view, refocus our efforts. Why on earth, I would ask you, why on earth would we extend a law that this court has found to be illegal? Now, given the overwhelming evidence that the current bulk collection program is not only unnecessary, but also illegal, I think we've reached a critical turning point. And I want to thank my colleague from Kentucky for coming to the floor to force us all to have this conversation. We've kicked the can down the road too many times on this particular issue, and I believe it's time to finally end the bulk collection of these phone records and instead focus more narrowly on the records of actual terrorists. Americans value their independence. I know this is especially true in my home state of New Mexico, and they cherish their right to privacy that is guaranteed in, by our Constitution. But some of our colleagues still think it's okay for the government to collect and hold millions of private records from innocent citizens and to search those records at will. The majority leader is asking us to act quickly to reauthorize. I believe it would be a grave mistake to reauthorize the existing Patriot Act. And I join my colleagues in blocking any extension of the law that does not include major reforms, including an end to bulk collection. 
I think we can and we must balance government's need to keep our nation safe with its sacred duty to protect our constitutionally guaranteed liberties. And I guess this brings me to my question uh, for the gentleman from Kentucky. How on earth can you possibly square what the Fourth Amendment says in terms of uh, our papers and our ability to control our own effects without a warrant with the government's bulk collection of phone records of law-abiding American citizens? Go for that great question. I think there's no way that we can square this bulk collection with the Fourth Amendment. I think part of the problem, though, is that we, over a long period of time, diminish the protections of records held by third parties. And I think one of the debates that we need to get, hopefully, to the Supreme Court sometime soon is, do you give up your privacy interest in records that are held by third parties? Because I think there will come a time that your papers that were once held in your house, there are no papers in your house. There may not be paper, but there's still the concept of records. And records were traditionally on paper and they were traditionally in your house. But now your most private papers are held digitally uh, by your phone and then by the people who uh, are in charge of the different organizations such as phone, email, et cetera. And I think that there has to be Fourth Amendment protection of these. And those who look at the court cases and go back to the, probably the last important case, the Maryland versus Smith case, they often say there is no Fourth Amendment protection at all for these records. In fact, the government will tell you they can do whatever they want with email, with text, with all of these things. And I'm not convinced that they're not using other programs, such as this executive order program, to actually collect much, many other kinds of metadata other than phone calls. So I'm very worried about it. I think we need help from the courts, but we need help from the legislative body to represent the will of the people. And I think the will of the people is very clear that the, the majority of people think we've gone too far and that we need to stop this indiscriminate vacuuming up of all Americans' phone records, regardless of whether there's suspicion. I would uh, ask the gentleman from Kentucky uh, an additional question, I, and I found it very helpful before I came down here today. Uh, and I want to thank you again for, for raising these critical issues. I went back and I read the Fourth Amendment, and I thought it'd be worthwhile just to briefly read that once again here on the floor, because I think it really puts you in the mind of some of the greatest Americans that ever lived. Um, our framers wrote a constitution that has survived for well over 200 years now. It has survived Republicans, it has survived Democrats, it has survived political parties that came and went, um, and it has survived great conflicts time and time again. It says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, shall not, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. And I would ask my friend from Kentucky his views on the resilience of this constitutional document and how you can possibly read the actual text of this Fourth Amendment without realizing that those framers really meant for this to apply into the future to things that we hadn't foreseen yet, using the broadest terminology available in using words like effects and papers. And I, I would yield back, and I just want to thank the gentleman from Kentucky once again. Um, this is one of those issues that unites people on the left and the right, Republicans and Democrats, who care deeply about our national security, 
but also care about our constitutional liberties. And I think uh, the time uh, to fix this is upon us. And without shining a light on this, uh, we certainly are, are not going to be able to make the progress that we need. We have an opportunity here, and we should seize it. And I, I yield back to him. Well, I want to thank the uh, Senator from New Mexico for coming down and for being a uh, great supporter of the Fourth Amendment. One of the things that I think is interesting is that in our current culture, we seem to devalue the Fourth Amendment. You go to, at least on our side, to all kinds of uh, groupings and gatherings, and there's a lot of talk of the Second Amendment, there's talk of the First Amendment, but there hasn't been so much of the Fourth Amendment until we got to this point where the collection of data I seem to be run amok. But one of our founding fathers was George Mason, and he was considered to be an anti-federalist. He was a guy who really stood on principle, but he was also a guy that, that had the uh, audacity to actually not sign the Constitution, even though he was asked and he was there and could have. And on September 17, 1797, he refused, or 87, refused to sign the Constitution and returned to his native state as an outspoken opponent in the ratification contest. His objection to the proposed Constitution was that it lacked a Declaration of Rights. Mason felt that a Declaration of Rights, or what we call a Bill of Rights, was a necessity in order to curb federal overreach. Mason, though, was also famous for being an author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written a, a decade or so before our Constitution, and upon which many things were based. He wrote in the uh, first paragraph of the U.S. Declaration of Independence something that is similar to what you hear in the Declaration of Independence. He wrote, all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which, when they enter into a state of society, they cannot, by any compact, deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. In the Declaration of Rights, which comes from 1776 for Virginia, he also was instrumental in including Article 9. Article 9 is basically the precursor to the, to the uh, Fourth Amendment. And in he wrote that general warrants whereby an officer or messenger may be commanded to search suspected places without evidence of a fact committed or to seize any person or persons not named or whose offense is not particularly described and supported by evidence are grievous and oppressive and ought not to be granted. So from the very beginning, the Fourth Amendment was a big deal. It was a big enough deal that the fact that it wasn't included caused George Mason to say he couldn't sign the Constitution. It was a big enough deal that this debate went on for a while, and finally the resolution of getting the Constitution included that there would ultimately be a Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson wrote about the Bill of Rights. He said, a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government, and what no just government should refuse or rest on inference. I like the way he put it. A Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government. It's a protection. Jefferson also described the Constitution as the chains of the Constitution. The chains were to bind government and to prevent government from abusing its authority. When we've adhered to this, when we've paid strict attention to it, we've maximized our freedom. When we've let our guard down, when we've allowed our guard to stray away, when we've allowed the government to usurp authority, to gain and grab and take more power, it's been at the expense of freedom. I think we can be safe and have our freedom as well. I think we can obey the Constitution and catch terrorists at the same time. I think, in fact, frankly, strictly from a, a practical point of view, I think we gain more information by using the Constitution, by having less indiscriminate collection of data, and by having more collection of discriminating data, data that's based on suspicion, data that's based on tips, data that's based on human intelligence, data that we can focus all of our human energy on, I think we actually will catch more terrorists. I think there's been instance after instance after instance 
where we did have information on terrorists and we failed to act. Perhaps because we're spending so much time and so much energy on the indiscriminate collection of data. William Brennan was one of our famous justices and he said of the framers, he said the framers of the Bill of Rights did not purport to create rights. Rather, they designed the Bill of Rights to prohibit our government from infringing rights and liberties presumed to be pre-existing. We didn't create the rights. Government didn't create your rights. Your rights come naturally to you. For those of us who believe in a creator, they come from our creator. But they're important to protect. They should be protected against all forms of even majority. It's why some of us are very important to say that we are a republic. We're not a democracy. That no majority should be able to take away our rights. And that's why this is important. I think that these questions ultimately get to the Supreme Court. Because no matter what the majority says here, no matter what the majority of the legislature says, the Bill of Rights lists and codifies rights that cannot and should not be taken away from the majority by a majority. The rights that we have to be left alone. As Justice Brandeis said, the most cherished of rights, the right to be left alone. But this debate is a long and ongoing debate. For nearly 100 years, from the Olmsted case in 1928 to the present, we've had a discussion and a struggle and a controversy over what parts of our conversations are to be protected and what parts are not to be protected. I think a lot of our problems really originated with going the wrong way in 1928 with the Olmsted case. Because we went for a long period of time, we went for two generations thinking that your phone calls were not private and that your phone calls were not protected by the Fourth Amendment. And then we finally get to the 1960s and we reverse that and we say your conversations are to be protected, but within a decade, we make the wrong decision again and say that your records are not to be protected, that your Fourth Amendment, re your, your records once held by the phone company aren't to be protected. I think that was a mistake. I think it's also a mistake to think that we're literally talking about paper in your house because there's quickly coming a time in which technology will be such that there will be no papers. Papers will be another word for records, but your records will not be kept in your house. They already aren't. There was a discussion of this, you know, in whether or not we can search a person's individual phone, and the court did rule, I think, in an accurate way. The court said, and one of the justices said, that basically the information found on your phone is more personal and more extensive than probably any papers that were ever in any home in a time before electronics. So we are going to have to catch up to electronics, we're going to have to catch up to a digital age, and we're going to have to decide, does the individual maintain a privacy interest and or a property interest. I frankly think that when the phone company holds my records, that they're partly mine, that there's a, there's a property interest and a privacy interest that I haven't relinquished. Unless I've given explicit permission, I don't think that I've given up my privacy. I don't think I've given up, and in fact, many times it's the opposite. Many times what we've actually said is, when I agree to do banking with you, or I agree to do, uh, have you hold my telephone calls, or I agree to do internet searches with you, I have an explicit agreement often. The agreement is so explicit to defend my privacy that when they don't, they're actually fearful of being sued. And so all of this craziness, all of this overreach, all of this loss of our uh, privacy comes with a little additional caveat that's written into all the laws and everybody's clamoring for, and it's what they want now, liability protection. They want to be able to violate their privacy agreement, so we give them liability protection. They don't want to be sued, but they realize they're violating and could be accused of violating our privacy agreement. So as much as I hate and despise frivolous lawsuits, the threat of suing somebody causes them to obey their contract. If they don't have the threat, if you say, well, we're going to have contracts, but we're not going to enforce them with the threat of a lawsuit, then contracts become meaningless. 
And so it's really important that as we move forward, we try to say to people, the privacy agreement you sign is a real document, it's a real contract, and it should be protected. When referring to the Bill of Rights, General Smedley Butler, who was a two-time Medal of Honor winner and a Brevet Medal of Honor winner, said, there are only two things we should fight for. One is the defense of our homes, and the other is the Bill of Rights. When I've talked to the young men and women who have fought bravely for our country, young men and women who have lost limbs, the families of those who have lost lives, that's what I hear from every one of them. I hear from them that they were fighting to defend the Bill of Rights. They were fighting to defend our Constitution. What saddens me is that while they were fighting for our Constitution, while they were fighting for our Bill of Rights, their legislators weren't fighting for the Bill of Rights. Their, their legislators were turning the other way. Their legislators were so fearful of attack that they gave up on the Bill of Rights and said, here's my liberty, just give me security. This is a long-standing debate. Franklin had it right. Those who are willing to give up their liberty may end up with neither. Now, some would ask, why am I here today? What do I propose to get out of this? Is there an end point when I'll go home and be quiet and quit talking about the Bill of Rights? I think there could be. I think if the leadership of both parties and the Senate would agree to have a debate on the Patriot Act, if they would agree to have amendments and have votes. And I'll give you some examples of some things that we think. Most of these will ultimately uh, be introduced in all likelihood by Senator Wyden and I. I'll start with the first one. And this is based upon a, uh, an amendment that he and I have worked on together. This amendment would prohibit mandates on companies that alter their products to enable government surveillance. So this amendment prohibits any mandates from government agencies requiring private companies to alter their security features, their source code, to allow the government to get into their stuff and into your lives. This amendment would apply to computer services, hardware, software, and electronic devices made available to the general public. Currently, the government is requiring, and sometimes telling companies they can't even tell you this, they're requiring access to certain products. There have been stories of them inserting malware on Facebook, giving you access to Facebook, and then getting into your Facebook account through the Facebook code source. I know Facebook has objected to this and fought them on this, but our amendment would say that the government just can't do this. The government cannot force different social networking sites and uh, different internet software, you cannot force them to give the government access indiscriminately. The question would be, can the government require things specifically? Absolutely yes. Present evidence and get a warrant and realize that when they want to make you so afraid that you give up all your records, realize that warrants aren't hard to get. The FISA warrants are almost without question agreed to, maybe to a fault. 99% plus of all the warrants ever requested are granted. I think it's not too much of a step to say that we should ask and request warrants. The second amendment that we would consider putting forward if we were allowed to and allowed to have votes on would replace the Patriot Act extension with comprehensive surveillance reform. We would replace the extension of expiring authorities with substantial reforms as originally proposed by Senator Wyden and Paul and others in the Intelligence Oversight and Surveillance Act of 2013. This amendment would end bulk collection and replace it with nothing. We would close the Section 702 backdoor search loophole, which allows the government to say they're searching foreigners' records, but to in reality gather up 90% of the records being American records and called incidental. We would close this backdoor loop where actually American records are being collected, not foreign records. We would create a constitutional advocate to argue before the FISA court, before the intelligent court. The reason I think this is necessary is that 
the court has somewhat become a rubber stamp for the government and we aren't allowing any kind of opposing arguments and we're really not even having any argument. So for example, we've loosened the standard from the constitutional standard, which is probable cause, and we've said it's relevance. So we get to relevance, but when you come before the court, I don't think anybody's debating or being asked to prove whether it's relevant or not. Certainly they must not because they're somehow proving the collection of everybody in the United States' record, which I don't know of anybody who believes that the word relevant could, could include everybody. So if we had an advocate or we had someone to say, this is the other side, I think it's really important. I'm not a lawyer, but I understand they argue with each other all the time. You're supposed to figure the truth out. And you argue and advocate for your side, and then somehow you arrive at a truth or people arbitrate what they think the truth is from this discussion. If only the government argues, you can't get even any sense or form of what truth is. So what we would argue in our Second Amendment is, is that we actually have an advocate that argues on that side. I would go further, though, and say that not only do you have an advocate, you should have an avenue for appeal. I'm with Senator Wyden. I want to protect all the people doing this. I don't want any names revealed. I don't want any agents revealed. I don't want to endanger the people who are risking their lives for our country to gain intelligence. But I do think that the law in general can be debated. Senator Wyden talked about how the law doesn't need to be secret. The operations need to be secret. So you can protect all of that. But I think the law should be debated. And for example, the question now whether or not you have any privacy interest in your third party held records, whether the Fourth Amendment protects these at all, that's a, that's a constitutional question. That should not be decided in secret, and you really can't have justice decided in secret. The other part of our amendment would give Americans spied on by the government standing to sue in court and end the practice of reverse targeting under which the government targets the communication of an American without a warrant by targeting the non-U.S. person they speak to. By some reports, it's even worse than that. I mentioned earlier that the a enormous amount of what the Patriot Act does, which was supposed to go after foreigners, is actually being used domestically for drug crime. There have been reports that the information is being gathered through an intelligence warrant and then they go back with a traditional warrant after they've gotten the investigation through a lower standard, through a non-traditional, non-constitutional investigation, then they go back and they get the warrant after using this information, or they recreate the scenario in order to get a, the information they need, and then they don't tell the judges they got the information through the intelligence angle. Another amendment that we would like to ask the leadership of both sides if they will let us introduce, if we're allowed to debate this and have an open amendment process, would be that warrantless spying cannot be used against Americans in non-terror criminal cases. This was originally the way it was, and this is why you have to worry about the slippery slope. Back in the 70s, they said, okay, we're going to have a different standard to get foreign terrorists. And even myself, who wants to keep good standards, can accept a little bit of that, a slightly lowered standard for people who don't live here and aren't American citizens and aren't part of our country. It has its dangers, but even I might be able to accept that. But what I can't accept is that you lower the constitutional standard, you're going to use a terrorist warrant that has a lower procedural hurdle, and then you're going to use it for domestic crime. That's exactly what's going on now. We should be appalled that they, they, they destroyed the Fourth Amendment for certain crimes, and we, we just didn't do anything about it. Section 213 of the Patriot Act is called sneak and peek. The government can go in your house and never tell you they were there. They can look through all your records. They can steal stuff. They can replace it. They can do all kinds of things, place listening devices, all without ever telling you. This is in contradiction to what most people have accepted the Fourth Amendment to be. But if you look at who's being convict, convicted with Section 213, 99.5% of the people are for drugs, for domestic crime. So what we've done is we've taken a domestic crime and we say the Constitution no longer applies. We basically got rid of the Fourth Amendment for these crimes. So for about 11,000 people a year, the Constitution no longer applies to them, we're using a lower standard. Now, if you want to make this even worse, 
Think about who's being convicted of drug crimes in our country. Three out of four people being convicted of drug crimes in our country are black or brown. But if you ask who are the kids that are using drugs, equal numbers of whites and black kids are using drugs. But three out of four people in jail are black or brown. And then you find out that not only have we messed up the war on drugs such that it has a racial element to it, we now are using a lower standard that's not the Constitution, and the end result is a racial outcome. This is an enormous problem. I mean, related to so much of what's going on in our country, so much of the anger you're seeing in our cities comes from this injustice. So you now have people going to jail. You have people going to jail for 15, 20, 30 years. There's a woman by the name of uh, Mary Martinson from Mason County, Iowa. Her, her mother just died recently, and they let, her, they let her out of prison for a couple of hours. Her dad's getting older, and she wishes she were there to help her parents. Now, she did mess up. She was a drug addict. Her boyfriend was a drug addict. They had guns in the home. He was selling the drugs. She was a meth addict. She was probably going to die if she stayed on the drugs. So it was good she got off the drugs, but she got caught, and she got 15 years in prison. You can kill somebody in Kentucky and be out on parole in 12 years. And yet we put this woman in there for an addiction. We put her in jail. She'd never, ever been convicted of any other crime. No judge in their right mind would have ever given her 15 years. Nobody would have. The judges basically are telling the defendants and telling the press, I would never do this. This is the wrong thing to do, but I am forced to do this. Compound this with the fact that the war on drugs has had a racial outcome. So you compound and put the two together, and you say, well, we're no longer obeying the Constitution, and there's a racial outcome. Where's the hue and cry? Where's the president on this issue? I've talked to the president about criminal justice. I think he sincerely wants to help. But here's the thing. The president could today stop this program. He could stop collecting stuff through the sneak and peek. He could say, we're no longer going to do the bulk collection. Most of these things originated out of executive order. He could stop these anytime he wanted to. We would stop it. We would say no more spying against Americans and no more use of this information for non-terror criminal cases. We have another amendment that goes to the heart of what I think should be decided by the Supreme Court. And in this amendment, we call this the amendment that would protect the privacy of Americans' records held by third parties. I think that your records, that you do retain a privacy interest. In this amendment, should the leadership agree to allow us to have amendments, this amendment would establish a clear principle consistent with the Fourth Amendment that as it relates to government collection, an individual's records given to a third party for a specific business purpose are equally secure in their person as those that remain in their possession, unless that third party informs the individual that it intends to share the information. This amendment affirms that the government cannot circumvent warrant requirements by taking Americans' records from third parties, and it protects the constitutional rights during engagement in regular communication and commerce. I think we had a vote on this a while back. I think we had, uh, we weren't that successful. I think we got four people to vote to say that your records should be protected by the Fourth Amendment. Most people don't really realize this. Most people have no idea that the government's position, and currently maybe the Supreme Court's position, is that you don't have any uh, right Fourth Amendment right in your, in your records, unless you've got them in your house. And uh, I think this is something that the more people understand it and the more people are drawn to this issue, maybe people will demand that we have some justice here, that we live in an era where ultimately no one, are gonna, no one is going to have paper records in their house. All of your records are going to be electronic. And because they're held and they're managed somehow by a third party, does that really mean we've given up our rights? See, the thing is, is the government might say if your cell phone's in your house, then they do, but the cell phone's connected to someplace outside your house. So your, your, your email's being stored on some server somewhere. I see no way that you could, you could, it could be construed that you've given up your right to privacy 
because someone else is holding the records for you because that's the way in the digital age we've come to to hold records. We talked a little bit earlier about trust. And I think trust is incredibly important. I don't discount that the vast majority of people who work in our intelligence community are honest, trustworthy, patriotic. I think we all want the same thing. We want to protect our country. We want to protect our loved ones. We want to, you know, honor the memory of those who died on 9-11 by catch, capturing and stopping the people who would attack us. But the question is, can you catch more or less or are we more or less effective in catching terrorists if we use the Constitution, if we use traditional warrants? And I think without question, if you talk to people, they'll tell you that they get a great deal more information and more specific information by using warrants. Let's say tomorrow that there was a president, that we elected a president that eliminated the bulk collection of data. Let's just say it happened. What do you think would happen? People are like, oh, the sky would fall. We'd be overrun with jihadists. Well, maybe we could rely on the Constitution. Maybe we could get warrants. The information's out there. There are warrants. If you make the warrant specific, there's no limit to what you can't get through a warrant. The warrants are given the vast majority of the time. People complain and they say, oh, it'd be take too long. It'd be inconvenient. Make it better then. Put your judges on 24 hours a day. Appoint 24 more judges and put them on call all the time and let's do this. There's no reason why you can't have security and liberty at the same time. Another amendment we have, should the leadership agree to allow us to have amendments and to have votes and to have a debate on this, is an amendment that would require the court to approve national security letters. In a three-year period between 2003 and 2006, 140,000 national security letters were given out. So national security letters are warrants that are below the constitutional bar. They don't meet the constitutional bar because they're not being signed by a judge. They're being signed by the police. So you get rid of one of the great protections we had, which was the check and balance that the police would always go to the judiciary. It was a different branch. The judge is sitting at home reasonable, hopefully re in a reasonable fashion. The judge isn't in hot pursuit. The judge isn't letting their emotions. Uh, the judge wasn't just punched by one of the convicts. The judge is sitting home in a reasoned fashion trying to make a reasonable decision. But still, the vast majority of the time, warrants are given. So if there is a policeman outside the house of a, an alleged rapist and they want to go in, they call on a cell phone. The judge almost always says yes. Same for murder. Does anybody imagine that there would be a judge in our country that you call them and you say, John Doe, uh, we have evidence that he traveled to Yemen last year. We have evidence that he talked to Joe Smith, who we have evidence is a terrorist, and we want a warrant to tap his phone. Look, I'm the biggest privacy advocate in the world. I'll sign the warrant immediately. I don't know of anybody that's not going to sign warrants to allow searches to occur. But you have the check and balance so it doesn't get out of control. What happened and what's happening now is we let down our guard, we have no checks and balances, and so what's happened is, what does the government do when you're not watching? If you look away, the government will abuse their power. Lord Acton said that Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The corollary to, be, to that would be that power grows. When you're not watching, power grows exponentially. And they will do whatever they can get away with. They will do it in the name of patriotism. And actually, I don't even question their motives. They, they, they believe themselves to be patriotic, but they think that we have to do anything that it takes, no matter whether... It goes in, it contravenes the, con the Constitution or it contravenes the Bill of Rights. The people who do this, their motives are good, but they're confused in the sense and they don't quite fully comprehend what we're giving up in the process. This amendment would require judges to write, to sign national security letters. It would make them more like warrants. In practice, National security letters have become warrants written by law enforcement without prior court review 
and approval, granting them almost unfettered access to individual email and phone communication data, as well as consumer information such as bank and credit records. Those subjected to the national security letters must also obey a gag order. So not only does the government come to you with a less than constitutional permit, a less than constitutional warrant, they then tell you you can't talk about it. You might go to jail for five years if you tell somebody you've had a warrant served on you. This amendment would require that a government obtain approvals from a court prior to issuing an NSL to a private entity, thus forcing them to demonstrate a clear need for information as part of an investigation. Amendment 6 would create a new channel for legal appeals for those subjected to government surveillance orders. This amendment would empower individuals or companies ordered by the government to hand over information about users or customers to make constitutional challenges in order to the order to be in order in the US Court of Appeals. My understanding right now is it's very difficult to appeal a FISA order. They're secret. Uh, you're not allowed to be in the courts, so you're really not allowed to participate in the process. I think also you can get outside of FISA by appealing, but I think you have to ask for something that's called a writ of certiori. It's a special condition, and it's not so automatic. And so my understanding is that the court will grant these things, but they don't occur very often. They're an extraordinary thing. And so what we would like to make it is a little bit uh, more of a, the facility of getting to a normal appeal, the way a normal appeal would occur. And so we've been pushing to allow that there would be uh, more of an automatic uh, sort of appeal here. One of the other amendments would say, be say, no liability immunity for companies that break their agreements with users. And like I said, while I'm not in favor of lawsuits and I don't like the idea of frivolous lawsuits, I think if you don't protect the contract, if you have a privacy agreement that says they're not going to share your information with anybody, the only way they'll protect it is if there is the threat that they could be sued for not protecting it. I think the contracts become not worth the paper or the click that I agree to this. It becomes completely worthless if the companies are told that they can go around it. The companies have all specifically requested this because I think they fear that every day the government is requesting them to breach the privacy contract. So in order to enable the privacy contract, I think we have to um, get to a point where people can sue if their privacy is violated. One of the things, and I think there can be a mixture of opinions on you know, what Snowden did, I think that we have to have secrecy and there have to be laws against revealing secrets. So I can't say we should have everybody revealing secrets. At the same time, I think the law says that those who are reporting to Congress should tell the truth. So we have the intelligence director lying to us and saying the program doesn't exist, and then we have someone committing civil disobedience. But when you commit civil disobedience, it isn't that we change the law and say it's okay. What we do is we say, you broke the law, and maybe you did it for a higher purpose, but it doesn't mean we, have, we will or get rid of all punishment for things like this. I do think, though, that there is one way that we could modify it. Snowden was a contractor, and we don't have very good rules for whistleblowers who are contractors. I would extend the whistleblower uh, statute for people who want to come in and want to tell an authority, an investigator general or somebody, if they want to reveal that they think something is being done illegal. For example, if Snowden knew that Clapper was lying, a felon, he's been convict, conv, uh, a felony has been committed, I would think that somebody who has evidence of a felony that tells the investigator general, look, I have seen this, and I have seen that they're collecting all American records of every American, and he says they're not, he's committed perjury and a felony. There ought to be some sort of whistleblower statute for that. So what we do in one of our amendments is to allow whistleblowers to be contractors as well. One of the things that's been going on, even predating Patriot Act, goes back probably into the 80s and 90s, is something called suspicious activity reports. These are now being done, I believe, by the millions. Okay, I think at one point a couple years ago when I looked at it, it was five million of these have been filed. So hundreds of thousands every year are being filed, and 
if the banks don't file them, the bank could have their license taken from them or $100,000 loans given to uh, $100,000 fines given to banks. So what we'd like to do is to make a suspicious activity report based on suspicion, not just based on a transaction. So we'd make it more like a warrant where a judge would actually review it and see if there's suspicion to be reporting this activity instead of just reporting activity based on the way people do their transactions. The problem has been is we now have the IRS confiscating your uh, money, your bank account, based on the way you make your transactions. So it's not based on a conviction, it's based on, I guess, the presumption that you are guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. This is also going on with civil asset forfeiture. So it's intertwined with records, and as we allow the government to collect our records in an unconstitutional manner, we have to be very careful that then those records are being used uh, with the presumption of guilt, not innocent. There's a great deal of question I have over Executive Order 12333. There are some that maintain, uh, John uh, Napier Ty was the, with the State Department and overseeing some of the freedom of the internet and government surveillance, and he's put out an op-ed that shows a significant concern for whether or not this executive order may be as big as bulk collection. I spoke with one of the founders of one of our, our America's larger internet companies recently, and he told me is he, not only is he worried about bulk collection, but he's worried that bulk collection might be smaller. The collection of all our phone data might be smaller than the backdoor collection through 702 and the backdoor collection through the government forcing uh, companies to allow uh, them into their software. And so our concern is that we need to look more at the executive order. I think it's being done in secret, but once again, evaluation of whether a law is constitutional or not, or whether a, a law overstates its purpose, should be done in the open. I see the uh, senator from Montana, and I'd be happy to entertain a question without losing the floor.